This is Nationalist Review. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to America's Most Resilient right-wing podcast. We took last week off as I was busy in communist-infested Seattle, Washington, fighting through hordes of Antifa and cat ladies to uh, bring you the video I did last week from the free speech rally in Seattle. But we're back this week with a second-time contributor to the show, second-time fill-in host, uh, a friend of mine for a long time now. We've been we've been doing politics for a long time uh, together, working together various places, Liberty Conservative and elsewhere. Uh, he's now serving as uh, part of the editorial staff over at AmfirstMedia.com, where we're working on building up a team of writers and uh, journalists to bring you high-quality American nationalist content. It is, of course, Leadership Institute veteran, <laughs> press, press F, Alex Witteslowski. <laughs> How's it going, man? Oh, dude, it, it's good. How are you today? Well, yeah, I'm doing really well. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk later about this story from the SPLC and the casualties of the alt-right. And uh, it was making me think of, like, casualties of Charlottesville. And uh, speaking of casualties of Charlottesville, I guess you and your position uh, <laughs> subverting Leadership Institute was <laughs> was one of those casualties. So, uh, Yep, yep. All for, for uh, you know, just just defending the rights of, uh, of people to have uh, their free speech and exercise it. Um, right. But, you know, that that's too edgy for the conservative establishment in, in the Beltway. So, yeah. And so for the for those of you out there who aren't aware of the Leadership Institute or what they do, um, let's let's touch on that briefly and and uh, not, you know, not get into too much detail. But but what is the Leadership Institute and, and what was uh, what is their objective, their supposed objective? And um, why are they so cocked on things like this? Oh, wow. OK. So um, Leadership Institute, it's a, a 501c3 nonprofit whose goal is essentially to train like uh, conservative leaders, I guess. So it's like grassroots activists, uh, campaign managers and campaign workers, uh, candidates, um, people who uh, like talking heads, you know, like pretty much like everything, uh, every role you can fill in uh, uh the conservative movement, I guess, is something that uh, LI trains you for. So, uh, yeah, and so I was a, I was a regional field coordinator, uh, training, uh, well, recruiting people and, and training people for like grassroots activism on college campuses and that type of thing. But uh, yeah, you know, like uh, Michelle Fields, for example, remember that guy that claimed that, uh, or the the gal, I should say, Michelle Fields, she claimed that. Uh, uh, Trump's campaign manager, like, uh, physically through her or something. And that turned out to be mm -hmm. bullshit. Uh, she was right. actually, she came out of either LI or campus reform, uh, which campus reform is actually LI's like, uh, news project website, uh, for the most part, right. they focus on, on college campuses. But yeah, actually, um, uh, you know, why are they so cucked? Uh, well, it's because they come out of the whole, like, post Barry Goldwater conservative milieu, right? So mm -hmm. uh, they, they are essentially in line with, the, with you know, neoconservatism and whatnot. And they have, like, a couple token, like, good libertarians. By good, I mean, like, they're good for the conservative establishment, right? Uh, but uh, they're not going to, you know... Uh, tip the boat too much or, or anything like that. So, but actually, you know, to be honest with the audience here, I, I recommend you go to LI trainings. Uh, so you should definitely, you know, I mean, myself, uh, I've read plenty from the left wing about political tactics and, and so on. And I think people should uh, go and uh, learn from the Leadership Institute how to be, you know, a better activist and I would also recommend you know while you're there I mean it depends on your goals but like don't be too explicit or anything and uh, you know like see if you can network with some more conservative types and uh, use that network for your own ends in the future well that's the funny thing is that you go to any one of these events and there will be a sizable 
minority uh, of people who are you know significantly more to the right than their organization would let on oh yeah and and who are more uh you know shall we say you know explicit than the organization will let on or allow them to be and so networking with the people who are who are at these types of events is very important i know that uh you know for example uh there were <laughs> you know they, trust me this is something that that you will learn firsthand if you start networking and going to events and this is one of the big pushes we've been making um on this program and on on this uh network now for a long time is to get people to go and integrate and network with their local organizations with the goal of taking power with the goal of reshaping them in our in our political alignment reshaping them for our political objectives you know get rid of the people who are who are going to signal about diversity and and multiculturalism and everything get rid of them there's no place for them on the right anymore and it's time that we take these institutions back and and if you are trained as an activist and you know what you're doing as an activist that becomes significantly easier i mean you could do it yourself just like not ever training i suppose but uh dude if there's an organization out there that's willing to give you free training uh, as an activist like you might as well take advantage of them and and uh, build your networks on their back and then uh and then use that for your own objectives so, yeah actually let me jump um, in real quick too uh since we're on this topic um another organization that does uh, a good training is called uh foundation for applied conservative leadership or FACL. uh and so they they do uh like this introductory political leadership school that is good more on like kind of like a strategy end right and mm -hmm. then uh uh the li trainings are better kind of on a tactics and you understand what i'm saying so like li will show you how to act do things right like okay well this is how you organ organize canvassing right when you go knock on doors or whatever this is the proper mm -hmm. way to table or fire that's more like li right uh, or like this is how you design a flyer. Like well, they have trainings on literally everything, right? But uh, uh, FACL Foundation for Applied Conservative Leadership, uh, their training is more like uh, how do you grassroots lobby politicians? And uh, right. in my opinion, FACL's grassroots lobbying training, which is just called their Political Leadership School, is actually better than LI's because uh, LI kind of sells you this whole myth that like. Uh, you should treat your politicians nicely and everything. And of course, they say that because, you know, uh, Mitch McConnell, for example, is a graduate from the Leadership Institute. So uh, and we all know the conservative base isn't too hot on Mitch McConnell. Right. So uh, they kind of teach grassroots activists there to to go, you know, play it easy with uh, politicians like that. But FACL tells you, like, how, how to actually put pressure on them and get your way with them. So uh, just throwing that out there. No, that's 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 very good. And, you know, these organizations, they may be ideologically bent towards kind of like free market Cato tier, you know, conservative libertarianism or whatever. But that doesn't necessarily invalidate the tactics. And we know that conservatives have a have a history of losing. This is absolutely true. Um, but the groups like LI have always been more um have always been breaking that mold or they've generally broken that mold and, and their activists generally have been able to accomplish things um, in their districts and in their states. So, uh, yeah, you know, learning these tactics, tactics from people who, who may, you know, they may be teaching these things for free with the intent that you're going to go out there and agitate for like, you know, free market, open borders, like Cato libertarians. Um, but we can easily use these tactics to push for um, right wing nationalist, anti-immigration, um, woke candidates. Right. I mean, I, I think nothing would be more more uh, shocking to them than uh, having somebody go, you know, use what they learned from L.I. to campaign for. Me <laughs> <or something. laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, that's a good way to do it. But, yeah, definitely, definitely uh, like activism is so important. And I think we're overlooking activism generally. Um, the people who will sit back and say, oh, you know, this activist group is gay. This this group sucks. Uh, so and so group doesn't know how to do anything. So and so group is incompetent. Um it's like okay well you know at least they're trying right like like at least they're out there trying and we could we definitely have room for improvement as a movement for sure but uh, i i would not want to be in the position of counter signaling anybody who's actually doing IRL activism fighting for what they what they believe in unless it's like horrifically bad unless it's like like uh you know Matthew Heimbach and like the like national socialism or death like world two or whatever <laughs> like that's gonna be like yeah I'll counter signal that because that's 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 uh stupid but, yeah but uh people who are are out there 
um, you know, on the college campus or, or on in their local communities out there fighting for, for nationalist ideas. Dude, how can you, how can you counter signal people like that? That's my question. But uh, speaking of counter signaling and people that deserve counter signaling, the FBI, dude, the FBI may be the biggest, this whole, this past month, I think the FBI has been revealed to be the biggest joke show, the biggest indicator of how deep into clown world America is. Our FBI, which we give billion, millions if not billions of dollars a year, spends more time hunting after like 13 Russian shit posters than they do stopping a massacre that they were well aware was going to take place uh, weeks if not months and years in advance. So we're talking, of course, about the Florida shooting and, you know, thoughts and prayers, of course, to the families involved. But you cannot, like, see this happen and and understand the full story without just being viscerally angry at the FBI. And we see all the lemmings, as Alex Jones would say, the, the lemmings, the uh, out there in the street, you know, fighting for gun control after this happens. And... Fighting for more laws, when but when you look into this and you realize the FBI was aware that this was going to take place for weeks in advance, it's like okay, more laws will not change a thing if we're not enforcing the laws on the books. More laws will not change anything if we're not using our intelligence apparatus to go after these people who we know are a risk, and and putting a stop to these things before they take place. So, um, yeah, I mean, Alex, uh, do you want to kind of walk through the just how much was known about this guy before? before the shooting took place. I mean, you know, we're starting, of course, with the fact that the Broward County deputies were called to the Cruz family home 39 times since 2010, oh, yeah. right? So there's definitely the police in and around this this person's house uh, in the in these emergency calls. Um, you know, the phrase is mentally ill person, child and elderly abuse, domestic disturbance, missing persons. Like, this was clearly like a, a shit show of a household. Um, now it's not clear whether these calls were directed at uh, Nicholas Cruz, but there's there's even more about this guy. Um, I guess I'll, I'll run through it here quick. Uh, the Miami Herald, this is according to Fox News, obtained records from Florida's Department of Children and Families and reported Saturday that Nicholas Cruz, 19, posted a video on Snapchat of him cutting himself on the arms in 2016. Um, the Florida Department of Children and Families investigated the video, and they found that there was uh, nothing... No, nothing wrong with that situation, apparently. Um, he was diagnosed with autism, but the claim was never verified. And I think the most the most damning part about this whole story would be, you know, we, we heard the reports about him being fascinated with guns and him loving weapons and everything. And, like, that in and of itself is not concerning, right? If someone just, like, loves guns and love, loves... I, like, I have good friends who, who love guns and love weapons, and they're not a risk to anybody. But this guy... This is again according to Fox. On Friday, the FBI acknowledged that the agency failed to investigate a warning from January 5th that Cruz could be plotting an attack. Quote, this is from the FBI. Under established protocols, the information provided by the caller should have been assessed as a potential threat to life. We have determined that these protocols were not followed for the information received by the agency on January 5th. So the FBI was tipped off about this over a month before it took place and they did not even investigate yeah, and didn't he actually uh, say in a YouTube comment that he was uh, a future professional school shooter or something along those lines? Mm -hmm. uh, yep, and that yeah. was reported to the FBI yeah. as well. Yeah, that was reported to the FBI and nothing Yeah, exactly. So, like, how do you not follow up on that? And, I mean, the, the kid obviously had uh, – I don't want to, like, make excuses or, or anything for a school shooter. Like, that's obviously – screwed up and unacceptable no matter what happened in your life but the guy obviously had a hard life right like uh he was adopted um and uh then his adopted mm -hmm. parents died right <laughs> and uh i i believe his mom died like a few months uh, like a or, week ago yeah, yeah, like, yeah a, like few a few weeks, weeks ago, ago maybe yeah like it was very recently his adopted mom and the kid obviously had issues. Um, I don't know if, if you want to uh, get into this right now, but I, I just thought it, it was interesting because, you know, there was that uh, false report about how he was like a white supremacist or whatever. And uh, left wing Twitter uh, is still going, you know, like trying to spin up these conspiracy theories. Like, and the guy said it, his real mom was Jewish. And, 
if anything, like this guy ends up yeah. being like a self-hating Jew, you know, and uh, obviously a disturbed kid yeah. uh, who was sick. Uh, on was he on any drugs, pharmaceuticals? Was that confirmed or no? They don't know yet, but I mean that's that's what they are so hesitant to investigate is the SSRI question. These uh, serotonin like reuptake like inhibitor. I, I forgot what the, the exact the exact uh, uh, acronym there is, but yeah, these mind altering medications that they put all these kids on. Um, dude, if there were if there were reports of him being like mentally ill and, and having these mental breakdowns, I virtually guarantee that in in modern society, there's no way he gets out of that without without being put on some kind of SSRI, without being put on some kind of mentally inhibiting drug. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, so. uh, I'll read off this next thing real quick. Uh, so so the left is arguing for gun control, right? Uh, so Senator Dianne uh, Feinstein from California, of course, announced her intent to introduce a bill on Friday that would require all rifle purchases from gun dealers be restricted to individuals 21 years old and over. And of course, they want other restrictions as well, but you know the the problem is is that no one is actually focusing. Uh, I think no one is really focusing on the mental health issues, right? Like, uh, and this is actually right. one of my least uh, conservative and least libertarian views. Is honestly, I wouldn't be offended if the government spent more on on mental health. Uh, just in general, it, it used to be the case that. Like uh, I actually visited one of these uh, like sanitariums, right? Sometimes they're called insane asylums, which I think uh, doesn't accurately like portray. Like it wasn't like crazy people going to these government funded asylums. Uh, it, it was, you know, like if you were like too stressed, you could end up going to this uh, asylum, right? Uh, for like mm -hmm. some yeah. time to chill out and stuff like that. Uh, it was actually pretty funny because um, in, in the 19th century, this was this was government funded. In the 19th century, uh, husbands would sometimes like send their wives <laughs> to these asylums for like not being a good enough wife. Uh, so it's pretty patriarchal. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, like we need to focus on. Impl implying, implying, we should. Oh no, bring it back. I, I totally I, I think, think that's the best reason to bring it back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am a hundred percent pro patriarchy. Uh, don't get me wrong, uh, but institutional thought patrol. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, but yeah, think about it. Like we we should be focusing on mental health. Uh, you know, uh, the SSRI question. Uh, you know, the antidepressants and, and other like antipsychotic drugs and, and other drugs that uh, people take. And, you know, sometimes it creates like homicidal urges, right? Uh, these definitely should be investigated. And uh, I mean, we know the whole pharmaceutical industry is is dirty, you know, like the Sackler <laughs> family, for example. It's, yeah, dirty indeed. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, by a specific uh, group of people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, um, you know, in addition to that, I, I do kind of think, you know, we see, you know, conservatives, uh, libertarians, people on the right in general, uh, th they'll always try to focus exclusively uh, on those two issues, right? Like, oh, what, what drugs were they on? Or, oh, it's a mental health issue, right? Like even Trump uh, said it, it was like a mental health issue or something along those lines. And, um, but I think, you know, an another thing we have to look at is, uh, the, the social capital and social cohesion, right? Like right. you're not going to go shoot up, uh, a dozen of your friends, right? At least most people won't, <clears throat> even most crazy people won't do that. Uh, right. and, and I think honestly, the, the issue is, is with all of this increasing diversity and mass immigration and white flight from cities, which, you know, like all, all these white people end up in these like cookie cutter suburbs where there really isn't any community, you know, uh, uh, it, there's not like a local convenience store or something that everyone can walk to, right? Like you drive everywhere, uh, you're on your TV all the time and uh, social media and whatnot, like, all of these things are reducing our social capital, reducing our cohesion, our connection with our community, and I think that's uh, that, that's a big issue. So that's definitely something that people should focus on, you know? 
Yeah, and and this kid, I mean, there's apparently now messages coming out that he was in like an Instagram, some Instagram group chat where they would talk about, they would use like very explicit like racial slurs and they would talk about their feelings towards like blacks and and like homosexuals and things like that. But it's important to to note that this kid was, uh, you know, according to his own words, ethnically Jewish and that he was clearly had some other like um spanish admixture like he he may have been like a sephardic jew or something like um but he was he was he, he, you look at the picture of the kid and he clearly has a a mix of uh a, a, a admixture clash there a phenotypical um melting pot for this kid and and i can only imagine what it was like for him like not really having an identity not knowing like what to identify with does he identify you know, and being adopted, like, is another layer to that. It's like, does he identify as a Jew? Does he identify as Hispanic? Does he identify as white? Like, where does he identify in this kid's whole life? It, it sounds like he had some other underlying mental issues as well, but that would only exacerbate those issues, this lack of identity, lack of a, a group to go home to and talk about these concerns or, or go through these problems with. Um, he, he felt, I, I, I can imagine, he would feel... Um, homeless you know in terms of in terms of a community in terms of a a group to to identify with and this is a problem for people and and this is in no way to like try to like rationalize or, or justify what happened no clearly this guy's a sick individual and he needs to be punished to the full extent of the law you know up up to and including um the death penalty which i think florida still has uh which is more than well deserved for this but but you're i mean we can we can examine why these things are taking place and i think the breakdown in in civil society is absolutely part of that rationale and dude a gun ban is not going to do anything to fix that a gun ban is not going to do anything to address the underlying issues you're going to see more and more people act out and and lose their sanity in a, in a true sense as as america you know gets gets worse and worse and uh, this is something that you saw that you see actually in china too with with um you know, people in China who become increasingly stressed, increasingly um, atomized, who are increasingly, uh, you know, have pressure put upon them by the government. I mean, you can look in China at like the knife attacks and like random stabbings and slashings and everything. You get people over in China who who just go fucking insane for a variety of reasons. And we're seeing that now with Americans too. People just snap. People just lose their mind. Yeah. And, and you know, we, we have to acknowledge as a society that, yes, mental health is part of this and and what is causing these mental health issues is it the drugs sure is it and that's, that's an important thing to look into but also we need to look at the social conditions that are leading people to to uh you know snap and break down like this and i'll just be you know remind everyone that this guy was not like he was not like listening to shows like this right this kid was not like ideologically um alt-right ideologically nationalist he had none of these none of these beliefs there we have no indication that he believed any of these things the, the left-wing media is trying very hard to spin this and push this as you know another alt-right murderer like james fields or something and it's like no dude like look at this guy and uh and tell me this guy was like a white nationalist. like like he he said himself that he's jewish so yeah. it's like i think that that precludes him from from being a a, a like a white nationalist murderer well, yeah, yeah. Uh, th there's that. I mean, on, on the topic of a gun ban, I mean, you bring up the mass stabbings in places like uh, uh, China, right? But we also see, you know, in places where there there is very strict gun control, right? Uh, you know, there is uh, Anders Breivik in Norway. Uh, there were multiple shootings in in France by you know uh, Muslim radicals, and when people right. when, when these terrorists uh, can't get guns. What do they do? They build a bomb, right? Or they get in a truck and run people over, right? There's plenty of ways to actually uh, murder people. And, you know, one of the uh, first, I think, one of the first, like, recorded large school shootings actually happened in Michigan, I believe in, in the late 1800s, if I recall correctly. Um, or maybe it was, like, 1920. I, I can't remember the date, but basically what this guy ended up doing uh, like he was uh, going bankrupt. His wife was sick, uh, like about to die, and he didn't have any money. Um, and he was a farmer, right? This was a rural community. So what he ended up doing uh, was like getting all the uh, like fertilizer and explosives off of his farm, packing it into the school, right? Uh, 
he murdered his wife, who was really sick and dying anyway. Uh, I mean, not that that makes it right. It's obviously, you know, messed up. But uh, he, he murdered his wife, uh, and then he blew up the school because <laughs> uh, he set a timer or whatever, right? The, the next mm-hmm. morning when students were coming in, uh, blew up the school and then drove there and shot people as they were running out, right? Uh, but point being is, like, you know, even back then uh, – should like you know stuff like this was happening um and all you need is you know explosives right uh and, and we saw this right yeah we, we see this happening in countries with gun bans sometimes it's shootings because guess what when you ban something there's going to be a black market for it sometimes it's you know explosives sometimes it's running people over with the car so a gun ban won't work but uh to your point about the social conditions you know uh another thing is uh the absolute nihilism we see coming out of Hollywood and the mainstream media, right? Uh, and it's always like, oh, there's no morals, uh, you know, besides maybe some SJW morals. But in large part, people are conditioned into believing, you know, there is no morality. Uh, you have to right. turn away from your religion, your Christianity, etc. cetera. Uh, and then we're surprised by like, you know, kids like this who – uh, you know, they don't mind dropping the end bomb or whatever, right? <laughs> yeah, in, yeah. Like, there's there's different reasons why you could say stuff like that. Like, I mean, when I was in high school uh, myself, which, you know, was a little while ago now, but like when I was in high school, I do remember some people uh, that I knew and was friends with even talking about issues like this explicitly, but they weren't nationalists or identitarians. Like, identitarianism wasn't even a thing back then, right? Uh, they were just plain nihilists, right? And they were like, you know, I, I hate everybody, like that type of dumb <laughs> uh, right. thing. But like, yeah, no, uh, this is why, you know, in general, our culture is degenerating, right? Uh, sure. It's not just lost. Yeah, there's, we're, we're being taught there's nothing to live for anymore, right? Like there's no, nothing to live for except for like globo homo and like the right to like shove things up your ass and like, like be a, like a, be gay. Like, like what else, if you listen to the mainstream narrative, like, like what else is there to live for? Right. You, you live for uh, consumerism, live for the new Marvel movie and live for, you know, taking prep and, and like, being, <laughs> like a raging homosexual. Like, dude, there's, there, there's nothing else. And, and the highest virtues we're taught now in society are like, diversity and like tolerance and inclusion and it's like can you can, can you start to see why like kids in gen z are are growing up and being like like total nihilist and they're just like like don't give a shit about these social conditions anymore they just like don't care right they, they don't care that like oh you're not allowed to say the n-word or something it's like i got nothing to live for anyways like i i have nothing going on in my life i have no future yeah. Anyways, like, why do I care about about what your these social mores are? And then to an even more extreme um, degree, you know, you get people who like this, who who just may think, yeah, there's literally nothing to live for. Anyways, you know, might as well go out in a blaze of glory. And again, this is not to justify their actions, but you can you can start to see why people give up on life, why they give up on society, why they give up on on these these values that you know we see to be inherent you know the values of oh don't kill people right don't murder like people at school but people just tune out of society and opt out and uh they just they just you know slip through the cracks like this and if i think if we had a country that made sense in a country where people would have to look after each other you know look after each other and care about each other and would have a reason to care about each other then you would start to see this this not happen as much and you know the, the whole thing about institutionalization it's a bad rap nowadays, and I, th- I certainly think there are risks, and not to like Ron Paul post too hard, but you know there's, there certainly is a risk that like you know your your cousin who doesn't like your politics could like have you involuntarily committed for like having the wrong views, and if the wrong people were in charge of the system, like this could be used as a political weapon. Like sure, that's a that's a risk, but I don't know if that was going on back when we had the institution system, back when we had institutions, mental institutions where people would be sent to. I think that we we see after we've gotten rid of the institution system, we see a lot more problems now. We see homelessness on the rise in places like Seattle and California, and Los Angeles and Portland, and I'm sure in the Midwest too oh, yeah. as well. And and we see people who who really have nowhere else to go, who end up committing crime or doing heroin or like, or causing these other social net, net negatives because they have nowhere else to go. They're too too mentally unstable to function in society. So. 
uh, I think if Trump really wanted to to make some some positive changes on this issue, he could bring back the institution system. Yeah, and you know that would be such a shock to the left too, right? If he actually did that, <laughs> uh, that because they're always saying like, because uh, you know the the right oftentimes they they talk about especially like the more kind of populist but still like uh, basic bitch right, uh, they'll talk about like oh you know the SSRIs right or oh mental health mm -hmm. but they'll never follow up right. on that with some solution to it right like obviously we don't want a bunch of crazy people to stop taking their meds <laughs> you know uh but you know i still think it should be investigated maybe it's over prescribed maybe uh but honestly i think there are other solutions to dealing uh with this mental health uh the root causes like we just discussed you know the nihilism in the media uh the lack of social cohesion et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, the mental health institutions, I do have, uh, you know, kind of a uh, inhibition, I guess, to this idea, uh, simply because th there was this um, Hungarian uh, psych psychiatrist, I believe, uh, Thomas uh, Sass. I don't know how to say his name, maybe Shash. I'm not sure. But uh, and he made this point, he wrote extensively about this, about how uh, psychiatry is increasingly being used as a tool of the state, right? And so right. that that definitely should be something we should be worried about. Uh, you know, we do see that, you know, when it comes to psychiatry and their DSM, which is like their manual of, uh, you know, mental illnesses, uh, they removed homosexuality, for example. They removed homosexuality from the DSM in the 1970s purely for political reasons, right? Uh, so, um, and, and there's other examples like that, which, you know. Like transgenderism in, in the DSM-5, yeah. Like, like yeah, no, they, they do that. And dude, it, you know, when you see all these like psychiatrists coming out and saying that uh, like, oh, Donald Trump is, is mentally unfit for office. It's like, okay, like if we give you the power to, to determine who's like mentally stable and who's not, like these, these people will just like round up every every fucking right winger and say like oh you're mentally unstable like get institutionalized bro oh and by the way turn over your guns so like yeah yeah there's there's significant risks for it and and that's i think one of the concerns that people like ron paul have brought up in the past um but uh, i think i think we can we can work to find some sort of solution here that that uh has a high enough standard of a high enough burden of proof that it couldn't be misused ideally i suppose um but yeah, uh, let's pivot to uh, away from away from that. That's a, definitely an important topic that needs to be talked about. But speaking of burden of evidence, burden of proof, Russia, Russia hacked our election. Um, we all know that, so don't even look into it. Don't bother investigating. Don't bother uh, asking any questions there, uh, Goy, about uh, Russian election hacking. Um, I found this this like fantasy land article from the Economist that I thought was was really. Uh, Really illuminating because it gives you a glimpse inside the mind of the cat lady who believes the whole Russian collusion narrative. So we'll go through this and, and kind of break down what the factual realities are here. Uh, again, this is from The Economist. A 37-page indictment against 13 Russians issued on February 16th by Robert Mueller, the special counsel, is packed with damning, astonishing evidence that Russian agents meddled in the presidential election of 2016. So what is this astonishing evidence they have here, right? The passage reproduces, apparently verbatim, what seems to be a confession by Irina Viktorovna uh, Kaverzina. She is one of the Russians charged with creating multiple false American identities to post, monitor, and update social media content designed to deepen racial and partisan divides and stoke Americans' distrust in their political democracy, implying democracy, on behalf of the Internet Research Agency, a secretive organization funded by an oligarch close to Vladimir Putin. Okay, so... Translation, like a bunch of Russians had American sock accounts that were like shit posting like political memes, and these were not even like good memes, like boomer yeah, memes. Yeah. And it was it was funded by a guy who like has once met Vladimir Putin. So wow, there you know, congratulations! Like there's your there's your Russian hacking, your, your Russian hacking narrative right there. It's like some guy who knew Putin once. Like apparently funded some shit. Yeah, um, if you look at the memes they produce, like you said, those memes are really like just boomer tier, just terrible memes for the most part. Uh, but also, uh, from what I've seen, I didn't, I haven't seen much that actually supports 
Trump, or I haven't actually seen anything that supports Trump coming out of them. They had some pro Bernie memes. I believe it was like a, a year ago or something there, or not a year ago, but a few, few months ago, there was a revelation where they showed like, Oh, here's a, a, a meme that, or here's something the Russians did to stoke racial divides. Right. And they showed uh, like an ad for a black lives matter um, or black lives matters um, protest. Right. So like they're, they're promoting mm-hmm. this stuff. And it's like, wait, so now you're saying that Black Lives Matters actually stokes racial division, <laughs> right? Like, what's the mainstream <laughs> merit, uh, hmm. ma- mainstream media's narrative here? Uh, so uh, I, I find all of that interesting. But in addition to that, I was actually uh, reading this other article this morning. Uh, I forget. I think it was like the Sunday Times or something. Uh, and they were talking about uh, this. And how they were uh, – apparently they organized the Trump rally. And, you know, I mean I've been a grassroots organizer and an activist and I've worked on campaigns and nonprofits and everything, right? So I was like – I looked into this. Like, OK, well, they uh, – I was curious because I've never known any competent organizer organize a rally purely off of social media, right? There's always like stuff that happens behind the scenes that people don't realize. And literally all these people did apparently was add people into a group and then say like, oh, we're looking for people to hold rallies. And then they just made the people that like volunteered or whatever uh, do all the work. Like they didn't help. They didn't provide them with any like connections or networking. They didn't help with any of the supplies, uh, any of that. Right. So like they didn't even right. organize anything. That's just a misnomer. Uh, that, that's a lie being pushed by the mainstream media here, right? Uh, like, they just, like you said, it was like 12 or, or so, like, shit posters, right? About a dozen shit posters who maybe create a couple groups. And then, like, this is supposed to be, like, uh, a bigger interference in our election cycle and in our political system than, you know, what Israel does, for example. Yeah, it's like, uh, hey, pal, you want to talk about foreign interf- interference there, pal? Uh, the JIDF, you know, you want to talk about that? Uh, <laughs> or you want to talk about um, APAC giving something like like $100 million to, like, Tom Cotton's campaign, like, over the course of several years? Like, you want to talk about that foreign interference? Or do you just want to talk about, like, 13 Russians who were, like, probably just... They were, dude, I doubt these people were even, like, ideologically motivated. Like, Internet Research Agency, that sounds like one of those things where that, like, sends you a pop-up and tells you to, like you know, pay fifty nine ninety nine, like unlock your computer from viruses and <laughs> shit. Like, like it sounds like like a, like a phishing a phishing scam to like scam boomers out of their their, you know, credit cards. Like it doesn't sound like uh I, I get it's supposed to sound like nefarious or whatever, but I don't know. I, I doubt this was even like politically or ideologically motivated. Because again, they were they were making like they were making the kind of memes that end up on that Twitter, like the cursed boomer images Twitter. Right? They were making the kind of memes where it's like like it's like uh, I saw the one a couple of days ago where it's like it's a T-shirt, right? And it says, "Student, God, why are there so many school shootings?" And then God responds, "Because you you don't let, let me in the school." Or something. <laughs> it's like fuck off. It's I mean it's it's kind of like well intentioned and like you know good natured like like you know conservative Christian type stuff. But it's like really, dude, you you want to tell me that that is what like swung the election for Trump? People looking at these like. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like shitty, like MS MS Paint memes is like what uh, what got Trump elected. Like I I have my doubts. Press press X to doubt. Uh, yeah, also foreign interference in the election. How about Mexico sending all their citizens over here to uh, you know pop out uh, children that can then vote in our elections? How about that? How about that foreign interference there, pal? Yeah, well, and actually uh, another one we could point out. You know, Israel, uh, Mexico, uh, Saudi Arabia. They spend more every single year pushing Wahhabism. Which is, you know, uh, the most radical form of uh, Sunni Islam. Uh, they spend more per yeah. year uh, pushing that Wahhabi ideology than the Soviet Union spent during its entire existing uh, existence promoting communism in the West. So that that is definitely something that should, we should also look into, right? Uh, so, yeah. like these mosques, you know, the, the, you know, the, it's interesting because you look at the funding for these mosques. Many of them, almost all of them in Europe, and many of them in the U.S. 
And you look at like who is pulling the permits to like get these things built, who is pulling, who is like funding these. And oftentimes, in fact, more often than not that I've seen, it's people from out of country. It's Saudis from out of country or like literally the Saudi government funding these mosques being built. So that is something that, you know, you know, you drive down, you drive, drive around Dearborn, yeah. you know, and you, you see, oh, there's a mosque on every corner now. <laughs> Think about why that is. Well, like you have our, our friends uh, in the uh, Saudi oil industry to uh, thank for that development. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, but of course, you know, the mainstream media, the political establishment, uh, they don't want to focus on any of these things, right? Because they want the cheap labor from Mexico, right? Uh, they're, they're bought off by, uh, you know, the Israeli lobby and uh, quite frankly, you know, endless wars in the Middle East actually benefit a, another one of their lobbyists, which is the military industrial complex. Right. And, uh, you know, Saudi right. Arabia is kind of the same thing. They've bought off a lot of politicians. They've sided with uh, Israel in the Middle East. And, you know, they're using American power as a bludgeon against their uh, Shia enemies. Right. Like Iran, like Syria. Yeah like uh, the uh, Houthis in Yemen, right? Which, you know, we're, we're, we're bombing Yemen and no one's talking about that, right? Uh, so uh, I think that... We have, a, we have a base in Syria nobody's talking oh, about. Oh, yeah, that's true. Right? We, we have bases all over the Middle East and we're, we're, we're killing Russians in Syria. Nobody's talking about it. Yeah. And, and you, you, when all of the, you see all this happening, you got, you got to wonder. Really, it really it has to make you think, like, uh, whose interests are being benefited here? Like, is America becoming safer? Is America becoming more prosperous or or strong by bombing these uh, by bombing Yemen, by bombing Libya, by bombing Syria, or are other geopolitical interests being benefited there when we're doing that? It really does make you think. But uh, yeah, you know that's that's the foreign inter foreign intervention they won't talk about. Uh, basically, I mean, so this this story is going to amount to nothing. Like these people are all Russian nationals. Um, they're not going to be extradited. We have no extradition treaty with Russia. Like this is just a smoke and mirrors show from Mueller to say, oh, look, we're getting closer to to the damning evidence of collusion. When anyone who sees this is going to realize like this is this is nothing. There's nothing here. And nobody will ever be charged with this. Nobody will, will ever be uh, convicted of this because these people are Russian nationals again and Russia will not send them over for extradition here. So nothing's going to happen. Speaking of nothing happening. The DACA deal appears to be dead on arrival. And this is, a, you look back, look back to old shows right here on, uh, or not here on, on Spreaker because uh, we don't have control of our Spreaker page right now. But you look back at the old shows and this is something that we've, we've been consistent on in this program for a long time, that uh, the a DACA deal is unlikely. And it appears that they just don't have the votes for it. Um, something interesting that happened actually was the DACA solution backed by McConnell and Trump got only 39 votes in the Senate, while the more like cucky bill got 54 votes, which is, of course, short of the 60 needed to overcome a filibuster. And people in the Trump administration now are just saying it's time to time to move on from this, dude. Like, we're not going to get a deal on DACA. The two sides are simply not going to come together on this. Time to move on, move on to infrastructure and get a big win on infrastructure right ahead of the 2018 midterms. Because if you do that, man, you're 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 seeing you you will see the Republicans pick up seats in both the Senate and the House. If you can come in with a tax reform win, people making more money, and a big infrastructure win to repair America's you know failing roads and bridges, and and bring uh, high speed internet to rural communities, like yeah, what are Democrats going to run on? Like ma Russia and ma trannies, like. <laughs> They're fucked in 18. Yeah. yeah, no, this was definitely a, a good play by Trump, you know, showing that he wants to negotiate, compromise, come to some type of middle ground, and then the Democrats still reject it, right? And, uh, you know, uh, I mean, a lot of these DACA illegal immigrant activists, they'll, they'll eventually start getting deported, <laughs> right? If the Democrats don't come to uh, a deal. So we'll see how much their base likes that when their people start getting deported. But yeah, this is a powerful issue for the Republicans to run on as long as the economy doesn't crash before the election. Because uh, uh, that, that's something I'm unsure about, right? Uh, we've had a very long recovery um, one of the, I think it's the second longest in, in history, uh, in, in U.S. history. And now, you know, like as long as the economy keeps chugging along, we should absolutely make DACA and immigration a centerpiece for the right. But 
uh, and you know going into the election. But what I'm worried about is I don't see much that uh, Trump or Trump's people are doing to get more Trump friendly Republicans in, right? Like not just Trump friendly, right. but people who are you know like another Steve King, right? Like uh, we need more hard right candidates on immigration. We're going to push the ball um, and on this on this issue, and I don't see many of many candidates like that, especially not being promoted by the you know GOP establishment, and that's one weakness that I think Trump has there. Uh, but overall, in terms of communications and messaging, I think this is going to work out well. Right. Yeah, and and the DACA maneuver I think was was very smart because it it gave the Democrats the opportunity to make a deal for their their precious dreamers. And yet they when it when it came down to it, it was not good enough. Right. It was not all 11 million. And you're seeing the fracturing of the left. We talk about it every week, the fracturing of the left. And they were looking out the the Democrats were looking out for their further left uh, browner constituencies who wanted a deal that gave them uh, all of them amnesty. They gave amnesty to all 11 million illegals, not just the 800,000 or whatever DACA illegals. So, yeah. I mean, no deal was ever going to come out of this. There's nothing that could be done. I, I still don't like Trump introducing the one and a half million as the new the new benchmark for amnesty. I don't like that at all. But it's looking like it probably won't even matter because there's going to be no deal. Now, the concern is, and, and trust me, I, I, I think anything short of mass deportations and magalites being unleashed on these fucking illegals and plastic handcuffs is a <laughs> failure um the concern is that daca will actually be protected by the judicial system uh judicial supremacy strikes again so these circuit judges like these these goofball circuit judges from the west coast from california you know further further reason why we need we need to let california like like split off and go their own way um, they have issued these injunctions against ending DACA. This guy, uh, William Alsup is his name. Oh, fuck. Uh, maybe a long lost relative there. My, my cucked, uh, cucked cousin in law or something, um, out there as a Northern California district judge, um, blocked President Trump's decision to end DACA, saying that it was based on a quote, flawed legal premise. It's like, dude. That is the most retarded thing I've ever heard. Like, like DACA was based on a flawed legal premise. DACA was based on a on a um, overextension of executive authority, uh, deciding just not to enforce immigration law. That was based on a flawed legal premise. Ending DACA is not based on a flawed legal premise. But anyways, so this Ninth Circuit Court judge um, comes in and issues this injunction, and now the Supreme Court has to decide whether or not they will hear the case, whether whether they will hear the appeal. Um, this is from the Hill. The Supreme Court will hold a closed door meeting to decide whether to take up a lower court opinion that blocked the White House plan to end the DACA program, which is at the forefront of the debate on illegal immigration. The nation's highest court will consider the possibility of reviewing the opinion without a ruling from a federal appeals court following a direct request from the Justice Department to, to decide the case, according to CNN. So this was, uh, yeah, so this actually didn't go to a, an appeals court judge. This just went to a Northern California district judge who blocked the decision. And, yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, I, this is imperative, dude. This is imperative that the Supreme Court hears this case and overturns it, uh, because I mean, like that will grant the legal authority to deport DACA recipients. But at the same time, Trump could honestly just like instruct DHS to import DACA recipients, and there's nothing the court could do about it. <laughs> yeah, there uh, something has to be done about all these uh, judges, right? That are you know trying to stop trump at every stop or like at every turn right like uh they uh, like they uh uh you know delayed his uh temporary immigration ban from nine countries that was based on uh you know uh, a law passed under the obama administration um they're stopping uh you know daca from expiring which is ridiculous because daca was first implemented as an executive action it was only implemented as an executive order by President Obama, by then President Obama, and right. it was Obama who set it to expire, right? And so it was set to expire, and Trump graciously uh, decided to extend it for a little more while negotiations are happening. And it's just ridiculous for a court somewhere in California to say, oh, well, you actually can't let this executive order expire 
that would be unconstitutional when in reality uh, an executive order allowing illegal immigrants to stay, that was unconstitutional. Oh, and b- by the way, I don't see any Judge Wittislawskis doing this, James. So yeah, uh, get, get your people in order. My sweet, my ang- the, it's the eternal Anglo, the eternal Anglo coming back to, uh, stri- he cries out as he strikes you. yeah yeah uh yeah it's like anybody who and i I guess i was a little bit uh brash earlier when i said this is retarded but like anybody who has taken like introductory government classes introductory like u.s government classes can tell you this is ridiculous that the idea that that a president ending a former president's executive order is like a flawed legal premise like no it's not most of these these executive memorandums just like stop being enforced when the new president takes over anyways, especially ones that are directed at enforcement like like uh, DACA is. These things just expire anyways. Presidents just like stop acknowledging them anyway. So so this is not unprecedented for Trump to be be rolling this back. But uh, yeah, I mean, hopefully the Supreme Court picks up on this. But even then, it, 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 there's again, the court has made their decision and now let them enforce it. Um, and the the need to deport these people becomes more more apparent every day. This is a story that I was first made aware of uh, by a commenter, actually, in one of my YouTube videos. Um, this is a story from Fox News. Um, quote, an unlicensed illegal immigrant was grossly impaired when he crashed into an ambulance and killed a three-year-old boy, court papers say. The boy, from Wise, Virginia, died Monday, a day after the crash. He was with his mother in the ambulance when it was struck and rolled over in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Lindsay Ann Oaks, 27, suffered minor injuries. The boy was not identified. Her, it's, uh, I would assume her three-year-old uh, son. Jose Duran Romero, a great classic American name, 27 years old, <laughs> blew a .19 on a breathalyzer nearly two hours after the crash. Two hours after he blows a .19. More than twice the legal limit. Fox 8 Winston-Salem reported late Monday. Court papers say Romero, who was behind the wheel of a Honda Accord, even though he had never owned a driver's license, had, quote, bloodshot, glassy eyes, slurred his speech, and looked grossly impaired, according to the station. Romero was in the country illegally. Federal immigration authorities lodged an immigration detainer against him after his arrest. They said he was from El Salvador. Now, this is all infuriating, right? So he gets in the crash, he flees from the scene, he runs away, then later they're arrested because this is this is what illegals tend to do because they don't want to get arrested and deported. So they'll, they'll get in these crashes and these, these drunk driving crashes and then just get out and run away. So it makes it very hard to identify often cases, oftentimes. Um, here's the most infuriating thing about the whole story. Romero was charged with driving while intoxicated and driving without a license. He was being held without bail after his bail had been set then revoked. It was unclear if the charges would be upgraded as a result of the child's death. Um, I have an idea for a charge upgrade. Firing squad for this guy. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, dude, if this, was, if this was a real country that made sense, we would, like, not be f- hesitating to just, like, get rid of this guy. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, death penalty. But in addition to that, I think it's time that we organize some uh, right-wing deportation squads and start getting all these illegals out of this country. Mm-hmm. Well, so an idea that I've, I've proposed in the past is privatized deportation, right? We, we uh, you know, like Blackwater. Like Israel. Yeah, 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 where they pay citizens like $7,500 to, to deport like Africans. Like, like hey, uh, <laughs> great idea, um, Israel. Let's, let's copy that for ourselves, for illegal aliens here. Yeah, I mean... Dude, it's 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 such a clown show where um because apparently now this guy got out on bail he apparently he got out on like a thousand dollar bail um is the the even more enraging part of the story it's like this guy comes to our country illegally gets in a drunk driving crash kills a child kills a three-year-old american child and we're gonna let him go we're gonna let him go on on bail no dude we should be letting him go um in a casket back to his home country like that that's not even like cruel and unusual punishment like he he murdered this child he's a child murderer execute him yeah no i mean absolutely the the idea that he's on bail like that's absolutely ridiculous the guy could you know try to uh you know run away or something still right like leave the country uh but yeah i mean he should be imprisoned uh you know this is like one of those cases where uh, the a, a death penalty looks uh, pretty appealing, but you know uh, the the bottom line is uh, we shouldn't be having this problem in the first place, right? Like we shouldn't have to fill our prisons with illegal immigrants 
to, you know, rob and murder people and do all of this, you know, other illegal activity that we don't want in our country. Like, this is why we need action on immigration sooner rather than later, right? Like, I mean, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but like, uh, this is why it's so important for people to, uh, you know, share news like this on your social media, talk about it with friends, whatever. Uh, if you're doing activism, here's an activism idea. If you're part of like a, a CR or some conservative group on your campus or in your community, next time you're flyering, right, or tabling, uh, print out these news stories, right? Uh, you know, news stories like this, and you can show, you know, you can highlight certain uh, things or like make notes or whatever in the news story, underline certain passages to point out like, look, here's an example of an illegal immigrant uh, murdering people, right? Like, and it's kind of an old school activism uh, idea, technique, but, it, you know, it's still relevant. Like, get, get the word out there so people realize how important it is to start taking action on this illegal immigration problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in the minds of the the eternal normie that has been like gaslit by by so much leftist propaganda in the media telling people that, oh, all these illegals, they're just like they're just Americans like you, Goy, like like they're just regular, regular people like you. They don't pose a threat to society. Uh, they, they just want to come here and work hard and, and, you know, take care of their families. It's like, no, a lot of them just want to come here and like mooch off our social welfare system, get drunk and and, you know, enjoy ride their Honda Accord with a with a straight pipe exhaust and like like run into people and like kill people like that's what these people are actually doing. Like they're not all Bill Gates, right? They're not all future doctors. Some of them are just like low lives like this guy. And yeah, uh, most of them are low. Yeah, lives. in fact, yeah, in fact, the vast majority are low. Lives. Yeah. Um, speaking of people who are are cucking, um, the papists, guys, we know that Catholicism is going to save America, right? Right, Alex? Catholicism, the Catholic Church, will be what saves America. Uh, uh, we have this on, on very high authority from some very uh, uh, wizened experts. Yeah, yeah, so so I hear. Yeah, uh, so, so we hear. The eternal papists. So speaking of the, the Catholic plan to save America is apparently by acting like a retard and... Um, browning the country entirely and that's how we're going to save america these catholic values will save america it doesn't matter what the demographics are folks uh catholic values will save america as we know from the president and ceo of catholic charities usa dominican sister donna markham says it is deeply dis disheartening she's deeply disheartened or deeply heartbreaking that nearly 800,000 illegal aliens do not have amnesty to permanently remain in the u.s after multiple amnesty plans failed to pass through congress this week leaders of the catholic church are decrying the lack of amnesty for illegal aliens enrolled in the president obama created deferred action for childhood arrivals program in an interview with American Magazine, the Catholic leaders, also fervent supporters of open borders, pleaded with Congress to immediately pass amnesty for illegal aliens. So, guys, I mean, look, Catholicism is always all we need. The church is all we need. Let's uh, let's invest all of our time and energy into spreading Catholicism and Christianity, because clearly Catholicism is going to be the silver bullet that uh, destroys Marxism, destroys communism in America, destroys anti-white, anti-American mm -hmm. sentiment in America. Catholicism is all we need. Yeah, well, you know, what What I find – oh, by the way, I'm actually – technically, I'm, I think I'm still a Roman Catholic, uh, believe it or not, because, uh, you know, I, I'm Polak, so obviously I was raised Catholic. I was confirmed in everything, and then uh, I didn't, like – really go to church anymore and stop believing and everything right uh i, I think confirmed, a lot of confirmed cuck <laughs> yeah, confirmed yeah. Cuck. uh so uh well i think a lot of people have like a, a similar trajectory right uh but uh you know like i i want to go back to church but like the catholic church especially in america is so cucked you right. know like it, it's ridiculous um but what's interesting is, uh, you know, obviously the Pope sucks as well. So uh, the the whole cuckiness goes out throughout the entire chain of, of the Catholic yeah. hierarchy. All yeah, all the way everybody from the uh, from the Pope to the altar boys, they all suck. <laughs> the altar boys, uh, I mean, in different I, ways. Yeah, the altar boys are victims. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, like I mean, yeah, it was in, in a literal sense, like they they're literally <laughs> forced to by by these priests yeah 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 by these dirty priests uh but you know what what's interesting is um uh, the catholic church in poland is actually like ridiculously conservative um so 
I, I don't know how, how that works or how that happens. Uh, I'm not an expert on, on the Catholic hierarchy, uh, you know, if that's up to the bishops. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if we were to fix the Catholic Church in America, uh, like, what are you going to do? You're going to get a bunch of people to pledge to remain celibate for the rest of their lives and, like, work their way up to, like, bishop and archbishop mm -hmm. and cardinal that doesn't seem like a very good idea to me uh and well, for, i mean for a lot of these people a lot of these people uh, remaining celibate wouldn't be a change in lifestyle so <laughs> yeah touche in incels i think for for actually some of the most vocal supporters of catholicism out there on the internet uh actually are uh <laughs> incels so uh yeah i mean this would not be a drastic change in, in lifestyle for them yeah, yeah. Well, but, uh, the, the, the question is, OK, the question is, we all have limited amounts of time, energy, ability to change things and to subvert institutions. And if you're going to spend your time and en energy subverting an institution, would you rather try to subvert the Catholic Church, which has a base that is, uh, you know, pretty hostile towards what your opinions? Or would you rather try to subvert the GOP, which just elected President Donald Trump? Like, where, where are you going to spend your energy there, pal? Yeah, and you know, uh, if you do live in an urban area, uh, chances are there's probably like an Orthodox church or something, which uh, they tend to be much more uh, conservative and, and pro, you know, traditionalism there. And, you know, you might be able to meet like a, a Russian QT for your future waifu, right? So, uh, or, or maybe a Ukrainian girl or something. So, uh, I was, I, I've nice. honestly, yeah, I've honestly been kind of thinking about that, but uh, I, I'm in the suburbs here in, in Metro Detroit, and the nearest Orthodox churches are like Greek and Armenian, and you know, I, I'm not racist or anything. I'm just not into non-white girls <laughs> like that. So, hmm, <laughs> <laughs> brutal neg. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of shit posting there. Uh, no, I, I don't have anything against Greeks and Armenians, but, um, uh, yeah. So anyway, yeah, but I mean, there's already churches out there that are a little more, uh, you know, pro-traditionalism, pro-conservatism, sometimes a little friendlier to nationalism, right? So, uh, that's something to look into, uh, for the people, uh, you know, for the audience in this program that maybe they do want to find a church. Uh, that's something I've been kind of thinking about lately myself. Uh, but, you know, like I said, like I'm kind of this uh, ex-Catholic that's – I'm kind of lost. You know, I don't have anyone to run with here. Uh, and, you know, so, some people on the internet saying Catholicism is the only way. And I actually have some, some friends who are like, uh, you know, tr traditional Catholics or whatever. Uh, and, you know, I'm happy for them that, you know, they have their cause. But uh, I just don't see how that's going to work. I mean, we, we have a guy that, you know, used to preach liberation theology or something close to it as the Pope now. You know, the Pope has given some prize to like an abortion activist uh, recently uh, from, uh, I forget where, I think it was from the Netherlands or something. But point being, it's the, the church is, it's over. It's kind of lost. Uh, yeah. It's time for, for people to look for a different religion. Just my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, and this is, I mean, again, this is nothing against, like, Catholics or people who choose to believe in that or, or, you know, Protestants or anybody. But it's like, if we're going to talk about institutional control and institutional power, I think we would be so much better served at trying to gain institutional control and power over political institutions in America that are already favorable towards nationalist ideas and not over institutions that hate you, right? <laughs> like, like, yeah, absolutely. Like, subverting the Catholic Church would be like subverting, like, the DNC at this point. Like it's full of people who hate you, and why would you why would you spend your time uh, going after that? Uh, very you know hard that it's a harder egg to crack, so to speak. Um, but so listen, uh, James. In the 1950s, the Democrats weren't for open borders, so therefore we should subvert the DNC. Yeah, and and they were also <laughs> the real racists back then, so we should definitely be more in line with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah you should <laughs> see what LBJ said. Like that guy. Yeah. Was, wow. Do you know, LBJ, our guy. Actually, no, LBJ, uh, LBJ killed Kennedy, so I will never say a good <laughs> thing about LBJ. Horrible, horrible person. Um, 
let's end on a white pill here for the immigration news. Um, like like we mentioned earlier, not a lot happening on DACA, kind of uh, at a stalemate. But on refugee resettlement, the Trump administration, and this this should warm the heart of every libertarian out there. So Kathy Reasonwitz, uh, all you like <laughs> leftist libertarians, uh, Jeffrey Tucker. This should this should you know be music to Jeffrey Tucker's little bow tied ears that more than twenty refugee resettlement offices across the U.S. will close as President Trump's administration cuts down on the costly taxpayer funded process of mass relocating foreign refugees across the country. This is from Breitbart.com. An exclusive Reuters report revealed that more than twenty refugee resettlement offices, supported by the federally funded nine voluntary agencies or VOLAGs, will close, and more than forty resettlement offices across the U.S. will cut back on their services. Currently, there are 324 refugee resettlement offices nationwide, but Trump's State Department told Reuters that all of the offices are no longer necessary because the administration has cut down on the number of foreign refugees being resettled throughout the U.S. So, good news. These these people are, their attempts to invade are being stymied by budget cuts. Uh, a good fiscally conservative maneuver here. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think the uh, resettlement offices that uh, are remaining. Uh, those should be, you know, the, the refugee program. Uh, you know, Trump has actually done a really good job in terms of cutting down the number of refugees we are accepting and also accepting better refugees, right? Like, for example, we're accepting more refugees from the Ukraine than we are from Syria now. And uh, we're accepting way more Christian refugees than we did in the past than uh, Muslim refugees, right? Like, you know, we've seen uh, what is it, the past two terrorist attacks in, in New York City, I believe, were by uh, Uzbek nationals, right? Uh, right. Uh, Uzbek Muslims. Um, yeah, the so, Sar Sarnayev uh, brothers. Yeah, Sarnayev brothers and then the, the Truck uh, of Peace well, guy. No, I think. Sarnayev brothers were uh, from uh, uh, southern Russia. They, they were Dagestani Muslims, I believe. Uh, oh, I Russia has its own problems like fighting Muslims in the uh, Caucasus. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I forget their names, but the guy that, like, ran over eight people with a truck or, or with yeah. a van on a bike path, that guy was an Uzbek. And then the guy that tried to uh, uh, blow up a bomb in a subway, but he accidentally, like, blew up himself and just injured himself because he's an idiot. Uh, these aren't high IQ immigrants we're accepting. Um, <laughs> uh, he was also an Uzbek Uh so, and both of those incidents happened in, in New York City, if I recall correctly. But anyway, uh, yeah, like, we're now accepting more Christian refugees. And I think, honestly, uh, if if Trump really wants to piss off Dems, I think the remaining refugees that we are accepting, that we are resettling, uh, they should all be from uh, either, uh, you know, white South Africans, because uh, we see that, you know, there's essentially like a low-level genocide happening, right, uh, with right. criminals going unpunished as they murder and, and rob uh, Boers and Afrikaners. Um, and also Ukraine, you know, like uh, over a million Ukrainians are, are refugees now due to the, like, low-scale war that's happening in eastern Ukraine there. And, uh, hey, a bunch of conservative whites, what's not yeah. to love there, right? And right. – uh, uh, so yeah, so uh, yeah, you're, you're not you're not going to see Ukrainians coming in and like blowing up subways, and you're not going to see white South Africans coming in and and uh, you know causing a bunch of problems. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, like uh, in terms of you know all these like pro, yeah, no, you're, you're you're totally right. And like they will integrate relatively easily into our society, right? Unlike yeah. these Uzbeks or Syrians or you know, especially like uh, you know, like. A Christian Syrian, maybe like uh, I have a lot of Chaldeans in, in my area. Like they run every liquor store or whatever, right? Like uh, they integrate okay, I guess. Uh, certainly not as well as like a white South African or a Ukrainian would, but but they're all right. But like these, you know, these Muslims from Uzbekistan or from yeah. you know like uh, uh, like Somalis, like straight up Somalis, like yeah, <laughs> good luck, bro. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, dude. The, the thing is, so out here in Spokane, out here in uh, in um, Eastern Washington, you know, 
farm country, right? Very rural. And farming is, is one of the number one uh, sources of industry, uh, farming and like, like hydroelectric power, like the two big things. And we have relocated in the past like 20 years. There was a big, a big celebration about this a couple months ago. Uh, they called it the 10,000 blessing celebration. And it was <laughs> to celebrate the 10,000 10, refugees that have been celebrated, that have been integrated into Spokane. And you look at these people and they're all like sub-Saharans or like, like straight up, like straight up, like, like Somalis or, or like Nigerians or whatever. And you look at them and they're doing like, they get up on stage, do their dance with like the tribal garb. And it's like, I was, I was watching that on TV and then I look outside and it's like three feet of snow on the ground, like 15 <laughs> degrees. It's like, these people clearly like are not suited for, this is like not, not similar to them, right? This is not comfortable for them. They're not enjoying this. <laughs> this is not a, an enjoyable place for them to be. Uh, contra and, and all the jobs around here are like agri or a lot of the jobs are like agricultural and that's something they don't have any experience with. Um, like, cause that doesn't exist back in their home country. It's like, okay, who's going to integrate better into a, into a society like this An English speaking 85% white area like this a bunch of somalis and nigerians or some white south africans that have been farming the land there for over 100 years that would love to to get a an opportunity to work in agriculture in, in a more objectively like more fertile area um where they're not going to be worried about like getting necklaced or like their eyes gouged out by a bunch of blacks like yeah you know yeah it's going to integrate better the Boers are famous for, uh, you know, like being great farmers and essentially civilizing that whole area, right? Uh, so there's no doubt about that. But, you know, like just kind of on a side note, uh, we, we do have some of these uh, like Nigerians uh, and some other like Western Africans in uh, Detroit. And so like when, when I did business sales uh, a few years ago at this point, uh, and, you know, Detroit was part of my, like, uh, sales territory. Uh, I met, like, a bunch of these Nigerians. And, like, uh, I'm actually pretty good with, like, understanding people who have accents, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but this, like, French African accent, it, it's the only accent that I, I don't, like, I can't decipher. Like, these people are so <laughs> bad at English. It's, uh, it's, oh, man, it's really, like, I've, like, I, it grinds my gears and I feel kind of bad saying that. Cause like, you know, my, my parents were immigrants and, uh, you know, and they have accents, but it's not, it's not a thick accent. It's not a bad accent. It's easy to understand. Uh, you know, other like professors I've had, even like ones from East Asia and stuff have had accents. And I, you know, maybe sometimes I had to pay a little closer attention, but I could still understand what they were saying. Right. Uh, but these guys from like West Africa, like Nigeria and whatnot, and Cameroon, uh, I, I have no clue what they're saying. I have to ask them like five times, like what? Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's pretty. Bad. Yeah. Hey, but hey, you know what? It's bigoted to expect people in your country to speak your language. That's a uh, racist bigotry. That's something that the Donald Blump would say. <laughs> yeah. Bigotry, you racist. But uh, yeah. No, but uh, it's good to see this this thing being being wound down because the refugee resettlement agencies, like their objective, was to put refugees into places like North Idaho and into places like Eastern Washington, places that are not like compatible, where they're not compatible, and they they did this intentionally to to, to diversify, quote unquote, all of these areas that were still like like normal American. Right, that were still like like ethnically homogenous. The goal of the refugee resettlement programs was to put them in places places like like Post Falls, Idaho. It's like, dude, uh, why are there being why are there all these like Afghani refugees being re resettled in Post Falls, Idaho? Why aren't they being resettled in like Los Angeles or or an area where they can uh, have people who are like them culturally? Well, I'll, like, I'll, I'll tell this you is, why. this is not good for them. Well, yeah, we know why. Like, like we, we know why that is. Yeah, well, I mean, it's because they want more more democratic voters, more left wing voters in those areas. But you know, I think honestly, like this is working out for us because more people who live in homogenous communities are now being exposed to what diversity and multiculturalism mean, right? Yeah. So uh, yeah. I, I think this is ultimately going to be a, a good thing for us. But you know, yeah, I mean, for for the sake of my fellow Americans. Uh, I do want this program to be shut down ultimately, but yeah, 
absolutely. Let's, uh, you know, 304 is a nice start, but let's uh, try to get that number a little bit lower there, Donnie. Yeah. Let's uh, bring that down to a nice, a nice even zero. Or maybe like, maybe we just have all the refugee resettlement offices in California and yeah. just like keep pumping, just like a, like an Africa to California pipeline, <laughs> like keep pumping in refugees into California uh, just to make their state worse and worse. But I don't know about that because that would exacerbate like white flight from California. And then all these like leftists would come to Washington and Idaho and Colorado and uh, make those states worse. So, yeah, yeah. well, Washington's yeah. already lost. I'm, I'm sorry, buddy. But yeah, thanks. Thanks, <laughs> Seattle. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate having our uh, Indian state senator, who's literally an Indian immigrant, coming over and then proposing uh, gun res- gun restrictions that would like ban the sale of magazines more than ten rounds and require like mandatory registries for like everyone with a ten round magazine. Uh, that's a that's a really cool feature that we have in Washington State, where we let literally people from India come over here and become our state legislators and uh, make our laws for us. Yeah, well, that Base. that's democracy, right? So. You yeah, gotta, we you gotta let foreigners now. move in and then run your country. Like that's that's the only way to be a true tolerant democrat. So yeah, well, look, look at this. Look at this base immigrant. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, put a put a nice end on uh, hour one. There, we uh, got to most of our content there. So we'll uh, come back in the second hour talk about uh, the diversity report, which is a recurring it's a it's a loved segment of the show we'll talk about the midterm elections a little bit and get into uh just a couple uh, ancillary stories that couldn't fit in anywhere elsewhere uh we'll do that all and more when we get back here on nationalist review see you on the other side of the break Two of Nationals Review. I am, of course, your host, James Alsop, joined by Alex Wodosolowski, back for a second hour of thoroughly irritating and, and triggering, but hopefully uh, hopefully encouraging stories as well. We have a mix. We have a mixed bag in the second hour. I think the first hour was was pretty heavy on the white pills. Uh, we got some, some total clown world stories here um, for the second hour, including today's incident of uh, the diversity report. The longest running segment now in the program uh, where we cover a story that seems to be coming out of uh, America's white minority future. So this is a, a combination because it talks it, it touches on the diversity topic, but also on the topic of just how how deep into clown world America is. So this is a story from Como News dot com. Illegal sought by ICE beheads his cousin, a Tukwila man. This is in Washington state, by the way. A man accused of killing his cousin has been on the radar of immigration and customs enforcement for months. The 37-year-old man arrested after human remains were found inside a storage container in the city of Tukwila was charged Wednesday with second-degree murder, according to court documents. Court documents state that Rosalio Ramos Ramos reportedly stabbed the victim to death and then decapitated the body. The victim, of course, was his own cousin. Investigators have reportedly been unable to find a Washington state ID for Rosalia Ramos Ramos, although he has a green card stating he is originally from Honduras, court documents state. Ramos, Ramos, 37 years old, has been sought by Immigration and Customs Enforcement officers since late last year and was almost turned over when an apparent lack of communication between police and Harborview Medical Center resulted in his discharge from the Seattle Trauma Hospital, police said. Chief Ken Thomas said police arrested Ramos Ramos in October after uh, he reported being involved in a sexual assault. After he was reported. Officers did not find any evidence of an assault, but found a drug pipe and a small amount of meth on Ramos Ramos. So, look, this guy who has been known to ICE for a long time uh, eventually snapped and decapitated his own cousin. This is the kind of, uh, you know, keeping it in the family that we, that we love to see from our uh, beautiful illegal alien population. Yeah, you know, what What shocks me is, like, how many of these immigrant activists, and a lot of the immigrant activists are legal immigrants, right? Um, they'll, they'll argue for amnesty, but then they don't realize that a lot of these illegals end up, you know, murdering and robbing and destroying uh, immigrant communities, right? Um, so it's, uh, or like, you know, 
in addition to that, obviously this guy apparently had a green card, right? Uh, in addition to that, we see a lot of these legal immigrants because we don't have good background checks. Uh, we accept pretty much anyone with like this diversity visa lottery. Uh, they'll also, you know, their their main victims are usually other immigrants. So, yeah, I, I think it's they they probably do know about it. They probably just don't care. I think they know about it, but their their objective isn't like the well being of immigrants. If their objective was was actually the well being of immigrants, they would be advocating for an immigration shutdown because they would recognize that more immigration suppresses wages for everyone working yeah. in America, including immigrants, illegal immigrants, and and residents and Americans. So if they were really looking out for the interests of immigrants, they'd be shutting, calling for an immigration shutdown. What they are advocating for, what their main objective is, is getting more Democrat voters and the further demographic shift in America. As Ben Shapiro has described it, the browning of America. Uh, ben Shapiro has also described me as a school shooter, <laughs> as a or theater yeah, shooter. Yeah. So, so <laughs> take Ben Shapiro's word with a grain of salt when he says anything. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, these immigrant. I think I think they'd have to be like monumentally stupid to not know that like illegal immigrants hurt immigrant communities. But I just really don't think they they care about it. Yeah. But uh, we have a second story for for the diversity report. A student. Who presumably, based on the spelling and diction in this uh, in this <laughs> note, is black, uh, is arrested for a school shooting threat. This is from the Sun Sentinel. Police arrested an 11 year old who was accused of threatening to shoot up her school in a nearby city. The Davie Police Department arrested Jasmine Powell on Thursday after they say she threatened to bring a gun to Nova Middle School and kill people. Davie Police said surveillance video showed the sixth grader placing a note under the assistant principal's door that read. Quote, I will bring a gun to school and kill all you ugly ass kids and teachers, bitch. I will bring the gun Feb 16, 18. Be, per- be prepared, bitch, is what the note said. Uh, so uh, the school is 40 percent black. Uh, you know, I, I, we can only assume, uh, you know, what was going on here um, based on the again, the diction, the language in the note. We can we can make some assumptions. Uh, look, I mean, this is just another another instance of cultural enrichment and i i well, I'm loving it i'm loving it i'm loving it well james Beautiful uh this vibrant. actually proves that the police is racist yeah because uh they arrested a black school shooter but they didn't arrest a white school shooter yeah that's true well you yeah. know i i wonder if she could claim like a sovereign citizen thing and say like she's actually a citizen <laughs> of, of wakanda and not a citizen of america <laughs> Uh, the <laughs> we need to we need to make that the meme now. Like people like when uh, when black black people get arrested, like they can just say, "Oh, sorry, like I, I'm I'm a sovereign citizen of Wakanda, not not of uh, the United States." <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd be funny. Oh, by the way, I'm actually gonna go see Black Panther later today. Um, so just thought I'd throw out uh, throw that out there. I'm gonna write a review for yeah. for Amherst Media. So yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that's my goal in seeing that, but I'm actually kind of excited, uh, like somewhat naively hoping that it's going to be like a black nationalist film, but, um, you know, more like, more likely than not, it's just going to be like pushing well, diversity. I've heard it. I've heard that it actually is. I've heard that it actually is like, like sort of black nationalist. Um, I saw Peter Sweden and Paul Joseph Watson with their their like nuclear hot takes on Twitter last night, saying that Black Panther is actually an alt right movie because it's about <laughs> ethnic nationalism. It's like, yes, Peter Sweden, that is absolutely what the alt right is uh, about. Uh, Peter Sweden is not a fan of that guy. He's comes across as kind of special, but um, yeah, no, it was, uh, what a. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen that that uh, that uh, Twitter uh, Twitter screenshot where uh, where Peter Sweden tweeted like somebody just threw a snowball at my at my house? Unbelievable! I've been stalked. And then like the next tweet is Paul Town like just threw a snowball at a disabled kid's window. AMA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's pretty funny. No, I mean uh, Peter Sweden is like. Uh, I guess like the Swedish or doesn't he live in Norway or something or he's like a Norwegian leaving, uh, living in Sweden. There's like something weird like that happening. Um, yeah, like he like left Sweden or something. Yeah. It's- yeah. Uh, so like uh, uh, who was it that I think Comrade Stump uh, actually tweeted uh, novel idea, a nationalist that doesn't live in the country he tweets about or something like that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, going, uh, well, let me finish on this Peter Sweden guy. Like he seems like a Swedish or Norwegian version, whatever of, uh, Laura Loomer, you know, uh, and, and her tires, like he's always like, I'm being assaulted. And like, it's always just yeah. way over the top. And I mean, you know, obviously there's reason to be mad at, at the left and Antifa's and, uh, so on and so forth. But like, this always this type of like whining is just kind of annoying. Like, uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to blow smoke up your ass or anything, but like, I like the way like you do stuff. Cause you're not always like whining and playing a victim, you know, except like when you legitimately are like when you got hit on a head uh, on your head with a flagpole, right? Like that, that's different than having a snowball thrown at you or having your like, tires blow out because you don't because you're a woman who doesn't know how to take care of her car dry rot like yeah your, your tire hasn't been changed in like 13 years it's like oh oh my tie has been slashed <laughs> <laughs> like no dude like the, the tire the date on the tire said like 2007 like those tires were 10 years old and they weren't changed like that's probably the yeah reason. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I I hate that stuff as much as anybody. Like like the Mike Cernovich. Uh, have you you've seen that video of Cernovich where he's like, I'm being assaulted, I'm being assaulted, <laughs> help, I'm yeah, being assaulted. Yeah. And uh, there's a video of like like that from like a distance, and it's like Mike just like standing in like a crowd of people, like with people like coming up to him and like yelling at him. He's like, help, help, I'm being assaulted. The t- intolerant left. It's like, oh my god, dude, how how it's so gay? Like, I just hate that. It, it just is so off putting to constantly be whining constantly be like rent seeking like oh no i'm a victim of this i'm a victim of that and the the thing i hate the most about it is like how legitimate people will like indulge that how like stefan molyneux will like like indulge that kind of behavior and be like mike is absolutely correct and i love mike Cernovich. like <laughs> dude molyneux like like i was watching you back when you were in ancap like back in like 2008 yeah. or like whenever you started your channel like like or uh, not 2008 but like like 2012 you know, it's like don't don't do this to me, Steph. Steph bot. Oh yeah. Don't screw yeah. me. Yeah. But uh, Molly knew Molly knew was the guy back in the day. Who? Molly Molly yeah. knew. Molly knew was great. Yeah, no, Molly knew has always been pretty woke. Uh though like some of his earlier stuff, um I remember when he like first came on onto the internet, like I don't know, I I think I started watching like here and there, of course, his videos back in like when he was in the twenties. You know, uh, when he still numbered all of them, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. And some of his takes were wrong actually, like about like Austrian economics. Cause, uh, but I mean, that's like a really dorky thing. I, I feel like a nerd just saying that, like, uh, but so, yeah, some of his, like, uh, what he said about Austrian economics was just plain wrong. Like that's not actually what, uh, like his, his video about the Austrian business cycle theory and stuff like that were plain wrong. But I mean, since then he's improved. And so far that like a lot of his videos are extremely fact based, um, especially like, you know, and he'll he'll interview people who are experts. Um, like I, I believe he had uh, what's his name, like Nicholas Wade, I believe the former uh, New York Times science writer who wrote that book about uh, uh, like race and evolution. Um, and he's, he's had other mm-hmm. experts. And yeah, and his, his channel is great. But yeah, you're right. It's it totally sucks how he legitimizes some of these people. Uh, you know, like Cernovich and and so on, uh, who are they just kind of suck to be honest. And the thing is, the thing is, he doesn't need those people anymore. Is a no, thing. It's like he's those never people don't. Them. Yeah, they don't have the legitimacy or the pull or the views even or the engagement. Like you look at Cernovich's Twitter account, and uh, dude, there are people like Cernovich has, has what like a hundred thousand followers on Twitter or something ridiculous. I think he has people, like four hundred k now, doesn't he? He, yeah, but he probably does. But his engagement there people, sucks. There are people with like 10,000 10, followers. People with like, people like, uh, like Mike Enoch, for example, with a fragment of his follower base with like way more engagement. Or even like oh, yeah. Spencer with, with like, with like uh, just a fraction of his, of his follower base, but like way more engagement. Like people don't engage with Cernovich anymore. And yeah. his, perisco- his periscopes get like a couple hundred views because like nobody wants to watch like the gorilla mind man like get drunk and like like shit talk you know on on twitter like nobody dude it's just not a good brand like they talk all the time about brand it's like it's not a good brand anymore and so i don't understand why molyneux continues to feel like he has to legitimize these people like molyneux could do really well if he got into like the blood sports thing right if if molyneux was like yeah 
it, like like more like highbrow intellectual like not blood sports so much as like debates but like Molly you could provide like the the highbrow debates that people are looking for because a lot of people complain that blood sports are too like juvenile or, or it's it's too much entertainment not in a fact base like dude Molyneux has the pull, has the ability, and has the connections and the clout to bring on experts and fields and have them debate and, and talk to each other. He could be doing that. Instead, he's like doing videos about like a night for freedom with Mike Cernovich and like talking to Gavin McGinnis about like whatever like dumb like gay stuff they want to talk about. It's like well, he, he uh, doesn't need to be he to keep legitimizing these people. Speaking of uh, Molyneux, did you see him trash Reason Mag? No, but that's great. <laughs> yeah, reason yeah. Meg definitely deserves it. Yeah. Oh, what, what do you say? Hold on. I, I got to find this now. Uh, but yeah, there he, he few, was trashing. few libertarians I hate more than like libertarian than uh, reason types. Oh, yeah. Reason types are the worst. I mean, they're the typical, uh, you know, like they're not they're not technically in the beltway, but they're, they're your typical like beltway esque libertarians. Right. Like, obviously. <laughs> that's who they, that's who they are. Yeah, <laughs> obviously Coke funded. All right, hold on, hold on. I, I got it somewhere here. No. Yeah, the uh, the Reason Mag types, the Jeffrey Tucker types, um, all these people like the. And it's funny because these are the people who back I think back to like 2014, 2015, who I was like really into. You know, like like this type of of thinking about politics in like 2014 was like what I was super into. Like. Because uh, I guess they weren't as shit lib as they are now back then, but basically free markets, leave everybody alone, mo individual rights, mo liberties, like um, anti-statism. Like th these were all ideas that were very appealing to me, and I think to a lot of people too, because we saw them as a solution to the problems. Like we recognized the problems in society, we, but we didn't understand the causes. And libertarianism offered the ability to escape, right? The ability to isolate ourselves from the declining social conditions and from things getting worse in society, things like welfare culture, right? yeah. like, like a lot of libertarians were like red pilled by welfare and they realized like, Hey, I'm paying for a bunch of like, like dumb people. Like, or, you know, if you don't understand IQ, be like, Oh, these, all these dumb people, dumb, lazy people who like don't want to work. And then you start to understand IQ and you understand like why they're dumb and lazy. Then you understand like other factors that influence IQ and you realize <laughs> like the full picture. Yeah. But like, uh, you know, like we saw, we saw libertarianism and, and, uh, lessening the power of the state as a as a way to solve these problems. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So here here's the thing. So Stefan Molyneux tweeted, "Reason needs to change their name to propaganda." So Nick Gillespie, who's that? Uh, he's that like all black leather wearing dork that is like the chief editor or whatever at, over at Reason. He uh, subtweeted Molyneux and said, "Being subtweeted by alt right sad sack." Stefan Molyneux is one of the best Valentines I've gotten so far today. And then Stefan Molyneux takes a, a picture of it, uh, tweets it a day later and says, low energy dishonest think tank, i.e. corporate welfare, lol libertarian, can barely get 10 retweets in over 24 hours. Are the Coke bros getting any value for the millions they've wasted on such loser organizations? Mm. Sad. And he has over a thousand likes <laughs> on this tweet. Uh, wow. And it's true. Like all these people, uh, you know, in the beltway and whatnot, uh, like on Twitter and elsewhere on Facebook, like they don't get any engagement. You know, it's like it's clearly something that's just funded from the top by rich mm -hmm. donors who are using these organizations to pursue their own agenda right yeah so uh yeah, yeah. but yeah and they're they're supposed to be the gatekeepers right people like Re like reason magazine or young americans for liberty with with uh big man cliff maloney um i i can't stand that guy <laughs> and uh, ty i mean dude uh, dude i got a facebook i gotta add on uh, not facebook too. but on uh it's from ty right bart for the ty the Ty Hicks like leadership seminar. It's like, oh boy, I can't wait for this <laughs> this shit show. Yeah. Uh, step one. Step one. Call your entire uh, support base racist neo Nazis for for voting for Trump. Uh, yeah. That's that's the number one. Uh, Ty Hicks while, persuasion. While spreading tip. fake news, because uh, you know th that's what he did. Uh, for for people who don't know, Ty Hicks. I, I don't know if he still <laughs> is the VP of of Yale of Young Americans for Liberty, but he uh, uh, was, and actually before he was VP. 
he posted something on Facebook, a fake news story about uh, a black church in the South being burnt down and, and someone uh, spray painting the N word on it, right? And yeah, I mean, like, and like hail, hail Trump. Yeah, yeah, hail Trump. Outside. And he's like, all Trump supporters are racist, and this is an example. And like, people are like, dude, like, WTF? Uh, and this is actually, this was like before a lot of us moved way further to the right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Catch my drift. No, a lot of us were, yeah. Well, and the, the dude, and it turns out, uh, no, yeah, you go ahead. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. And it ended up Tell turning out story, that, that uh, news story was false, <laughs> right? Like, it was a black guy that burnt down his own church and he did it for some personal reason and he decided to yeah. spray paint some stuff about Trump or, or whatever in order to, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, distract investigators, apparently. But he still got caught. Yeah, it was a hate crime hoax. Another yeah. one of these hate crime hoaxes. Uh, imagine my shock but and, and then like this goofy guy this ty hicks guy um he like wouldn't retract like his claim he's like well like he wouldn't even address it he wouldn't even address the fact that he like was wrong about about uh yeah. the story and and was wrong about like all trump supporters being and, and here's the thing after that happened that's when he got promoted to vp and by the way like just throwing this out there young americans for liberty they're uh uh their fundraising from grassroots sources has completely collapsed and they're now taking be between 600 and 700 thousand dollars last i heard from the Koch brothers every single year in addition to getting mm. offices in the Koch building right which surely those offices are either free or subsidized right discounted essentially so uh this is like a, a organization that used to be grassroots uh, but, you know, too many derpitarians were running it, and now it's been essentially captured by the Koch brothers, and it's just a tool of the Beltway establishment to, like you said, they're the gatekeepers for the liberty movement. And that's why we're seeing, like, the liberty movement is essentially dead, right? Like, this happens... Oh, dude, yeah. it's, it's, it's fucking dead, yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah, I mean, like all all the quality people who were involved in like like libertarian or or like liberty politics like have all gone further right. Like like anybody of quality like has has left that sinking ship. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it is unfortunate because I mean that was, I, I guess it's not unfortunate because like that was I guess the last attempt for people for like like white men who like didn't want to be racist you know to like like be involved politically and be like be like look we, we just want to be left alone we just want small government we just want to want individual rights and liberties and all these things and we don't care who you are we don't care about about immigration we don't care about people coming over as long as they're like have our ideals and all this stuff like that was the last ditch attempt to to get to 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 try that to try that bit and it failed completely. And now everyone who was of quality of any intelligence in that movement has realized, like, yeah, like we didn't want it to, but it turns out that like race matters. It turns out that that where you're from matters. It turns out that immigration matters. And, yeah. Well, uh, you know, I, I think they could have kept their movement alive had they uh, not pushed away a a everyone with those views. I mean, uh, like myself, I've actually I've been a race realist for uh years at this point but you know like a as a libertarian i always thought like okay we'll end welfare and then like all the dumb people will <laughs> die and yeah there's going to be a racial disparity there but uh i'm you know whatever i'm an individualist who cares about groups but, yeah but it's but it's 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 de facto fair yeah. right like like on paper it's completely fair like to end welfare like there's no there's no like unfair racial element to that it's just like yeah we're ending welfare it's a program we're ending it and it's gone and so whatever happens is you you can kind of externalize as a libertarian you can you can rationalize what you know will happen which would be like oh yeah like like immigrant communities and like minorities would be like disproportionately affected by this but as a libertarian you can you can rationalize that and be like no it's just government right it's just it's just the end of a government program and so whatever happens is is going to happen like naturally like without any yeah. force that's the thing is it won't involve force so you can you can say this this is okay because there's yeah. no force involved. but you know it's gotten to the point in the libertarian community now where like uh you can't even accept uh, uh so I, I realize we're liberty posting too much but uh i'll wrap it up here soon but like you can't even say for example you're against like the 1964 civil rights act 
which forces businesses and, and private people to integrate. And it's like, well, wait a second. What about property rights? What about freedom of association? Right. Or like uh, right. you can't have a differing view on immigration based on the idea that, uh, you know, public property like the commons should be uh, treated differently than, you know, like a lot of libertarians have this idea, well, like we all should have equal access to the commons. So if you want to, you know, do a naked gay pride parade in your city uh, with lewd sex acts in public, you should be totally allowed to do so. Whereas like, you know, I think it's equally valid to say, well, you know, taxpayer owned property, uh, like taxpayers do have a right to setting standards, you know, including when it comes to borders and who's allowed to cross borders, right? As long as we have a government like that, you know, that should be regulated in a way that benefits the current existing tax base in the country. Um, right. Cause they're like, they're like the shareholders yeah. of the Well, like you can't make, or like, for example, uh, you know, arguing against affirmative action based on, you know, uh, race and IQ differences and, and things like that, that are completely scientifically validated. Right. Uh, but you can't make any of these arguments anymore without being labeled a racist, a bigot, uh, alt-right neo-Nazi yeah. or a- anything like that. And, you know, that just pushed so, – like that's why the liberty movement failed. Like under Ron Paul, it was large. It was kind of crazy because you had all different types of factions, right? But at least it was large and was united towards doing one thing. But then it, it started dying off. Rand Paul got like a fraction of the vote and a tiny fraction of the fundraising that Ron Paul did. And now the Liberty Movement is just uh, Koch brothers bought off. It's it's unimportant. Yeah, it's it's not a movement. Like the, the people who are involved in like are like thoroughly irrelevant. Like I I, can, I cannot think of a single like relevant libertarian. Yeah. Anymore. And you know five five years ago that would have been would have been a different answer. Like you could you could name some people who were actually impactful. Like maybe the like five twenty thirteen. Yeah, I guess like like. Um, because that was after the on the heels of the Ron Paul campaign, and yeah, it's like there was there was still some hope there, but f- un- fundamentally, a lot of those, or fundamentally, the libertarian movement or liberty movement would not address, or was incapable of addressing issues that that are real, right? There was a lot of like very intelligent autism <laughs> yeah. in the liberty movement, and there still is among libertarians. Like I went to a Mises event uh, this past summer, uh, set up by. By a, a, one of our mutual friends, <laughs> who we don't have to name yeah. uh, here on the on the program. Yep. I, yeah, I think you know who it is at Mises. Um, and uh, and uh, I, I met Walter Block there, and where I was talking to Walter Block, um, who is of course uh, author of uh, "Defending the Indefensible" and uh, books one and two. There's two books, um, and he mentioned like race and IQ, like in his in his presentation and i thought oh, that's pretty interesting so i i went up to him afterwards and i, I was talking to him about like um proposing like you know perhaps like an iq based immigration system and what what his thoughts on that were and he told me he's like well i don't want any immigration system i think we should have completely open borders <laughs> and people can like voluntarily create communes like among people who they want to create communes with and i was like okay like in principle in like like a very like like i hate to use it as a pejorative but like in a very like autistic like set of principle a way of thinking like like that makes sense right but it's like that's not how the world works yeah fundamentally fundamentally that's not how the world works yeah you know what what libertarians need and hoppa kind of moves in this direction uh but not enough like uh you know the, in, in communism there was marx right who pretty much created communism uh, as, as a philosophy, and certainly what most people call communism is de facto Marxism, right? Uh, but, you know, and then Lenin came in, and uh, like Marxist Leninist philosophy is like, okay, here's what we want ideally, you know, like the stateless communistic society, blah, blah, blah. But in order to get there, we first need uh, a dictatorship of the proletariat. We need a vanguard uh, that, you know, establishes socialism and then eventually we'll get to communism like libertarians uh need an idea like that because many of them are kind of too radical for their own good there's a lot of uh anarcho-capitalists and so on and uh they, they need a lenin that's like okay well you know maybe our ideal goal here is uh uh this like anarcho-capitalism or whatever 
but in order to get there, we we need a Pinochet, right? Like we need someone to take power, like drop commies out of helicopters, shut down the borders, right? Uh, start aggressively privatizing certain things, but while simultaneously taking on certain entrenched plutocratic, uh, you could say rootless <laughs> cosmopolitan elites, right? <laughs> but certain entrenched interests uh, that have that, you know, they're as large and powerful as they are, influential as they are because of government favors. And I think honestly, you, you kind of yeah. need the government to uh, cut them down to size, shall we say. So, uh, sure. Yeah, like th- they need some type of intellectual figure like a Lenin, right? Uh, but I think they're they're too cocked to actually do anything like that, right? Like uh, I, 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 think, I think, yeah, they're they're cucked by their own radicalism, yeah. and they're they're cucked by their own purity, and that's the thing that I I will say when I still talk to like some like there aren't that many libertarians out there, so like it's uh, anymore they've all moved either to the left or to the further right. And so what I'll tell the few libertarians that I still talk to and encounter is like all of these ideas, like these ideas of like anarcho-capitalism and voluntarist society and, and uh, moving towards like a stateless society, like these are all like interesting ideas, right? These, these are all the, like, I'm interested in these topics and I would like to talk about them and debate them, but you are not going to have a country where these things can be debated or even considered if you have a country controlled by Somalis and, and immigrants like from the third world. Like if you have a country that where the mean IQ is like ninety, you're just not going to be able to. Have, you will not have a populace that can think in these abstract terms. Oh yeah. And so if you want to, if you want to, you know, talk about these things and have a country where these things can be talked about, okay, fine, we can do that. Well, I, I promise you, we'll talk about that after we fix the demographic problem. But I need, I need your help right now. We need your help right now to, to reverse and fix and, and correct the demographic change. And that's I, my always been my uh, my narrative to libertarians, and and most of them like respond well to that. But um, like there there are still some people like I find this often in the Proud Boys. Like the Proud Boys would be like, "Nah, man, like that's just identity politics, bro. Like we don't stand for that." It's like, okay, um, yeah, <laughs> you know, square square one. Yeah, they they go. say they don't stand for uh, identity politics, but as soon as like. There's like one black guy in their Proud Boys group. They're like, "Whoa, it's a base black guy. Let's take a photo so I can prove I'm not racist." Like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, "Whoa, hold on, I thought race, yeah, I thought race didn't matter. I thought Proud yeah. Boys, I thought race didn't matter." <laughs> yeah, interesting. Um, all right, let's uh, let's pivot back to the electoral politics stuff. But, uh, like, the funny thing is, libertarians, dude, the conversation of electoral politics is something they are not even qualified yeah. to talk about at this point because. They they have no place in electoral politics. So uh, some news out of Ohio that is uh, generally good news, not perfect news, but good news. The Ohio GOP has officially endorsed U.S. Representative Jim Renacci, Jim Renacci, I don't know how to say his name, for U.S. Senate by an overwhelming margin. Uh, Jim Renacci is the guy who is running, who has tried in the House to crack down on illegal immigration. He has voted for work visas and... Um, some more legal immigration policies that we're not exactly fans of, but he is on Trump's side on trade, right? He he's uh, said to um, he said in interviews that he wants to stand with Trump on issues of trade, and he wants to get the Trump agenda passed. So this guy would certainly be an improvement over Sherrod Brown, who's a big anti-gun senator out there in Ohio. So good good to see Jim uh, Renacci get the. Um, official endorsement of the Ohio GOP, especially over this guy Mike Gibbons, who is like endorsed. So the guy, he he never stood a chance of winning, but he he has previously endorsed like um, the, things like the TPP and like big trade deals as being great for for yeah. mo trade and mo GDP. So good to see people like that. Uh, well, uh, Mike Gibbons is like a uh, Cleveland banker, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Uh, Oh God! I wonder. Wonder where his allegiances lie. Uh, the banks. Yeah. So good to see you out of Ohio. Um, we're supporting uh, Renacci. Obviously, he's not perfect, and uh, that that Josh Smith guy, uh, Paul Nealon. This is perfect segue. Paul Nealon's um, campaign, like like some like campaign director or whatever. It's like weird, like gay Jewish guy. Um, Ebola American. He's, he's literally like a J- gay Jewish guy. Um, like attacked me for on Twitter for like for like supporting Renacci, and it's like okay, dude. Like 
<laughs> um, who is more likely to vote for the wall, Jim Renacci or or Sherrod Brown? Who is more likely to vote for immigration restrictions? Who's more likely to vote to cut welfare to illegal aliens, Sherrod Brown or Jim Renacci? Uh, you know, I got your answer there for you, pal. And uh, wait, so uh, is that is that guy on Twitter? Like, uh, I saw some people joking about gay Jewish Nazis. Is is that what they're referring to? Yeah, Ebola American on oh. Twitter. It's like a gay Jewish guy with like a history of like mental illness and stuff. Um, oh, okay. So that, that's yeah. funny. Actually, that for, uh, he's, hey, he's look, he's he's supporting Neilan. He's he's getting yeah. some good propaganda out there for Neilan, which is which is great. But it's like if you're gonna purity spiral about about candidates not being perfect, about your can these candidates not being ideal for you, uh, try not being a homosexual Jew, pal. Like, <laughs> like if you yeah. want to tell me about like about like how how pure uh, your your political objectives are, it's like, dude, nobody's perfect, right? Nobody nobody is is uh, is flawless, and even political candidates. But we got it. We cannot make the perfect the enemy of the good. And there will be candidates out there who suck on some issues. There will be candidates out there who are strong in immigration, but they're like, you know, they're they're cucks on like social security or something. It's like, dude, yeah. we can't we can't like like be so hardline that we throw out candidates who are like eighty percent good but like twenty percent shitty. Yeah. Well, what you should have asked them was, hey, who's more likely uh, to vote for the wall, Jim Renacci or Paul Nealon? Because <laughs> look, who's I'm more sorry, likely to have I, an I opportunity like to vote for the wall? Yeah, fuck. I, I like Paul Nealon, but he's most likely not going to be in Congress anytime soon, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, he's not going to be able to vote. It's that simple. Like, uh, I, I do like. Uh, there's a danger to taking this pragmatism too far. Like, don't vote for every Republican, right? But if, right. if someone right. is decent on these issues. Uh, they are actually pushing the ball in our direction. And I, I do think uh, they do deserve your vote at least, right? Yeah. No, uh, like so. I, I voted in Washington State. I'll be very clear about this. I voted for Patty Murray, like one of the most leftist senators in the country in 2016. I voted for Patty Murray because the Republican nominee was this uh, fat schlub named Chris Vance who supported TPP, who supported Amnesty for Illegals, who was against any more border security or enforcement. He like cries about, this is not who we are when uh, he sees like stories about deportation. This guy is an ultimate cuck. And so I voted against him. I voted for the Democrat to send a message to the state GOP that like, if you nominate people like this, I'm not going to vote for him. I will vote for your challenger, who is at least an honest leftist over this like wolf in sheep's clothing cuck Republican. Yeah, well, so, I mean, we, we got to clean the Republican Party out. Uh, and, and that does start by, you know, cleaning out uh, neocons and these other like left wing GOP, you know, the, the GOPs uh, mm -hmm. who are wrecking the party. Right. Like um, uh, what's that one like establishment guy who runs Americans for tax reform? Oh, Grover Norquist. Uh, he, he always describes like pro tax hike Republicans as being like a. Uh, rattlesnake in the bottle or something like that right point being is like they kind of ruined the brand right the brand mm -hmm. that we want is a more nationalistic uh gop right so we got to start getting rid of all these globalists these neocons uh and, and so on you know the, the zionists and, and whatnot who you know they they want nationalism for israel and never-ending wars in the middle east but uh they're against you know any semblance of border control in the United States. Uh, we need to start getting rid of all these people. And uh, even if that means that the GOP takes an L, because mm -hmm. uh, quite frankly, I don't want these people in my party and I want them right. to lose every time they run. And I want people to realize it's no longer uh, possible to, to win with these conservatives, right? Yeah, no, exactly. We, we need to make it very, very clear. To everybody holding the power that, that is still interested in winning elections, that if you nominate a cuck, if you nominate someone who wants open borders or mass migration, we will not vote. Like, you cannot take us for granted. Okay? You cannot take uh, us us for granted. Ever. And so if you nominate bad, bad Republicans, if you nominate, like, John McCain to your – Bob Corker to your people, like, yeah, we're going we're gonna to stay home. You know? You're not yeah. entitled to our vote. And yeah. and so that's why I had no problem morally voting for Patty Murray because it's like, look, she's a shit lib. I know she's a shit lib, but I'd rather have a shit lib and and have Chris Vance get one fewer vote 
then uh, then have me vote for then then cast my vote like dishonestly for for uh, a, a GOP leftist. So, yeah, I mean, we, you know, we get accused too of being like Republican. Party. Like we don't get accused. Like certain other people do get accused of being like GOP shills, and mm-hmm. I think that's a valid criticism. Like you don't want. Uh, the nationalist movement to be co-opted into just another like GOP like get out the vote effort, uh, but if it's if it's if it's a get out the vote effort for candidates that are GOP that also like want every illegal sent back and want to close the border, like are you really gonna are you really gonna say that oh because they're GOP I'm not gonna vote for them that's stupid that's that's monumentally stupid the way to change policy that we don't like is through political means like i know i know how great it would be you know all these people who say like oh politics is gay democracy sucks like read siege like, <laughs> <laughs> like dude okay like you honestly think that is more is more practical than than uh, political action you're you're uh, deluding yourself bro yeah absolutely uh you know <laughs> read siege god that's so dumb but um yeah no you're totally right about political action and you know people kind of i think forget that uh, people like us, uh, we're pushing the ball uh, further to the right. We're, we're kind of expanding the goalposts or you know, expanding the Overton window, right? Uh, in, in the right right word direction, I guess you could say. So, mm. uh, and, and that makes it people uh, possible, I should, it makes it possible for certain people in the GOP to take uh, positions that are further to the right than they have been in the past, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And to actually enact legislation like that, uh, and so I think, but but people have to remember, like, you know, some guy isn't going to get elected saying everything that we're saying right now, right? Uh, and I, I think even someone like uh, Ann Coulter or uh, what's her face, uh, uh, Ingram. Laura Ingram, Mm -hmm. like she's not going to get elected. I mean, not that they plan on running or anything. They don't. But like uh, I think maybe even they're a little too far to the right, right? But, um, you know, candidates like just a tiny bit to their left can get elected, right? Uh, Or even not not to the left like on policy but just like like in terms of rhetoric. Like I think the rhetoric might be the issue. Um, And and I I would even push back on that a little bit because like we are not – dude, at this point, it's funny because at this point, like Paul Nealon is more like radical than than I am, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or or, or, than, or than we are, or especially in terms of like like I don't know in terms of ideologically, like how much of, of what he says is trolling, how much is genuine, but like certainly in terms of rhetoric, like Nealon is much more like far far out there than uh, than either of us are, and so I think that like somebody using like more of our rhetoric, like America First rhetoric, and focusing on America First issues would stand a chance. Like honestly, I think Paul Nealon. Um, you know, if you, I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's it's too early to say with his campaign, but like, I certainly think that the the level of um, explicitness that uh, he has gotten into with with a lot of the questions of a uh, certain tribal elites and certain uh, special interests has uh, has probably made things a little bit harder for him oh, yeah. uh, in his campaign. But even if he doesn't win the campaign, even even if he doesn't win the election. He it will still be a win for the nationalist, right? Because he has expanded the Overton window so far that now anyone who who comes in behind him and says something that like like more like what we're saying, or more like what Laura Ingram is saying, or or Ann Coulter is saying, will be seen as not as radical. They're they're not as radical as as like Neilan, right? Yeah. So so it, it allows the backfill to take place, the backfill behind. Like Neilan is like the earth mover, like like pushing pushing the dirt out of the way, uh, and then people and there you know people fill in behind him and uh, and uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I do kind of wish though that Paul Neilan hadn't gone so explicit. Um, I think he could have done uh, performed pretty well in in the primary, even if he didn't beat uh, Paul Ryan. I mean, you know. Uh, uh, People are mistaken when they think it, it's easy to beat someone like Paul Ryan just because he's hated elsewhere. Like, no, man. Like, there's a there's a reason why that guy got elect, reelected so many times in his district, right? Um, yeah. And he yeah. has all this money and campaign infra- infrastructure. His entire GOP behind him. So uh, I think you know this entire time it was an uphill battle for Paul Nealon. I do think though he could have. Uh, uh, had he been more like Ann Coulter, except uh, you know maybe he he'd be a little more like 
Ron Paul on Israel, right? Um, I think he could have done really well, right? Like, uh, I that's a pretty good spot to be in, considering everything that's uh, happened in mo- happening in modern politics. Uh, but right. he just started like, yeah, like, oh, you're a Jew, you're a Jew. Like his his Twitter it, it, was it, like, it's a question of crazy, yeah, yeah. It's a question of priorities. I mean, you only have so much attention that you can get from people people right like attention is is a product essentially and are you going to use people's attention when they pay attention to your campaign are you going to use that to highlight the failures of paul ryan and look you can be completely woke on all these other issues you can know what's going on but are you going to use the time to and this look again this is if if we were if i was advising a candidate who who wanted to win an election like i think i think that paul nealon at this point, wants to move the Overton window, and yeah. and I commend him for moving the Overton window. I think that's great, and I'm not I'm not trying to attack Neilan at all. Yeah. The point being, though, it, it's a different strategy, right? There are different strategies for different objectives, obviously. And if your objective was to win the election, I think he Neilan would be spending the time that he has and the, the attention that that he can garner from people on like, hey, why are these illegal aliens murdering people? Oh, this is Paul. This is Paul Ryan's fault. You know, why is it harder for Wisconsin Wisconsinites? To get a job nowadays why are these factories moving overseas oh paul ryan's fault immigration right like you you can present the the problems in america as the fault of paul, paul ryan like very easily. oh yeah this guy's been in congress and been in authority for a long time um you know I, I a winning campaign probably doesn't involve telling ben shapiro that he he is going to go to hell because he's a jew <laughs> you know it's like, so that's that's it's really like, funny. look and, and look that's, it's funny and and whatever cool what great but it's like again different strategies different strategies yeah but yeah and and now he's yeah yeah i think we we people are gonna understand that i think that's a very like reasonable opinion too like Absolutely. i think a lot and to be fair people are thinking that you know everybody everybody's thinking this just like nobody wants to say it so yeah well so. you know I, I think it's pretty clear that paul nealon like he just something happened and he just had like a fuck it moment you know yeah and he's just like you no, know he, what? i'm he, just gonna say what i'm thinking and uh I, I got to kind of awesome. respect that, but at the same time, I, I am uh, sad because uh, I wanted hit, to see him do better this cycle than he did in uh, 2060, right, against uh, Paul Ryan. So, Dude, can you imagine the media freak out if he gets like 18% this time instead of 16%? Oh, like that if, would if be his numbers, beautiful. If his numbers go up after all <laughs> Dude, I, I, I would uh, – wow, that would be – truly something else yeah but you know uh i mean the reason we're talking about paul nealon though right is because he got banned off twitter and uh right. that's something that's ridiculous now twitter is literally banning political candidates right uh right. and so i think that's something that really needs to be brought up and you know uh nealon's proposed uh, shall not censor legislation is mm-hmm. something uh I think, you know, we need to, like, build a grassroots movement around this and uh, uh, actually, you know, do something to, to push this bill because something like that needs to be passed, right? And when you think about, yeah, when you think about Twitter and do the amount of power they have uh, to control the, pol- the political discourse, and then you combine in the fact they're controlled, like, one of the, some of their major investors are, like, Saudis. It's like, okay, this, this, company this private company beyond regulation that has such immense power over american political conversation owned and operated largely by saudi arabians is banning american politicians who criticize certain interests like how is that not a problem for americans how are how are americans not like up in arms about that yeah yeah no that, that's absolutely wrong and I, yeah like you said twitter largely owned by uh saudi right um you know, ADL, which is like explicitly uh, a Jewish pro-Israel or organization, right? Um, uh, they're they're yeah yeah radical. they're, they're radical. helping uh, to do like uh, uh, censorship on Twitter, right? And on YouTube, I believe. And mm-hmm. uh, so, like, it's Twitter at this point is actually in the service of foreign interests, right? Um, and yeah. we're supposed to like censor ourselves on their platform i know i mean you were banned 
Now, Paul Nealon, a political candidate, was banned. Like, it's ridiculous, mm-hmm. right? Uh, they they banned uh, Jared Taylor, but not like they didn't ban David Duke. <laughs> like, what? You know, like Jared Taylor of all people, he's like the most soft spoken, like grandpa ish person, right? Um, on the like far right, I guess. But like, it's uh, this whole thing is just ridiculous. How you know they're they're censoring uh, real Americans just because they want you know open borders, multiculturalism, they want endless wars in the Middle East for Israel um, and all these other things. Yeah. So uh, it's absolutely wrong and shall not censor. It needs to be passed. And actually, let me kind of circle back to uh, the first hour in the beginning. I talked about, uh, you know, LI training and FACL, the Foundation for Applied Conservative Leadership. Well, everyone go on your computer right now, Google Foundation for Applied Conservative Leadership and look up uh, the nearest uh, school, the political leadership school, the one-day class. It's like 30 or 35 bucks or something for one day of good training, right? Go there and, and learn about uh, – this is what they teach you, grassroots lobbying. How do you flip your congressman or your senator uh, or even your state legislator on an issue? But go to your nearest political leadership school, learn how to do this. Okay, and then when we get a bunch of people trained up, you know, maybe after 2018 or whatever, uh, we should start focusing on, you know, pushing through a shall not censor uh, legislation. Because uh, if you think about this is a survival issue for us. Like if we can't use social media, like I'm actually on a 30 day Facebook ban right now. No, so am I. What a coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. What a coincidence. We we, we sorted all this out over, over, uh, yeah, like flock and like text message because like, (laughs) because we're both, we're both banned from Facebook. I I got banned for saying tranny. What'd you get banned for? Uh, (laughs) well, I, I can't understand why they banned me. Um, (laughs) but, uh, you saw that Obama portrait. Was, yeah, uh, yeah, it was absolutely ridiculous. Like he's sitting down, he's like in a jungle or some shit. Um, and uh, mm. uh, the the painter was this radical anti-white painter who he has actually painted multiple paintings of black women uh, decapitating white women, right? Uh, so, yeah. and I saw someone Photoshop this uh, Obama portrait where he was wearing <laughs> the uh, coolest monkey in the jungle sweater. <laughs> And I shared it on Facebook. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's way too funny. I was like, Oh my God, I know people are going to hate me, but I I have to share this. And it it got me a 30 day ban. So, uh, but previously the prior times I was banned was actually kind of bullshit, but you know, like honestly the effect it's had on me is like at this point, like if I can get banned for saying something mundane, then I'm just going to say whatever the hell I want. Because I yeah. don't even care anymore, you know. Yeah. Like, so yeah, yeah. No, it's kind of kind of good, dude. I, I've been uh, totally off of social media now, off of Facebook and Twitter for the past like fifth, uh, two weeks, uh, completely off both. Um, and it's it's good because it, I think it like gives you more time to like think and like not have not like that instant like dopamine response, you know, like of, of social media and everything. Yeah. Um, constantly like like feeding you dopamine. It's yeah. good. It is good. Um, yeah, I've been reading uh, a lot more actually. Yeah, reading Siege definitely, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. We 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 disavow uh we disavow that behavior here on the program. Um let's talk real quickly about uh speaking of narrative and and um the narrative that the media tries to put forward. Uh, one of the narratives that the media has been trying to put forward for a while now is that anyone on the far right, the nationalist right, the alt right, um identitarian or any anything you want to use as a label alt right they are violent they're murderers they're part of their ideology is is violence right they 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 need violence to accomplish their objectives and this is the pretense that people like sargon 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 the vacad uses when he like <laughs> debates people like andrew anglin or richard spencer when and he won't debate me I, I, sargon will not accept my debate challenge he uh he commented on my video i did about him and he's like you don't understand you simply don't understand my ideology and i was like okay you want to debate and he like hasn't gotten back to me um but 
this pretense that, that the alt right has to be violent. And so there's this piece in the SPLC, which we know, we know, we know the SPLC is radical, left leaning. Um, you know, certain people control the SPLC. Like we know all that, right? Uh, Andy Worski actually called the SPLC and asked if he was banned from Israel, which was a pretty funny, uh, <laughs> pretty funny YouTube clip. You should go check out. But they compiled a list of alt right murders, people who who murdered people. All right, murderous. Okay, and wait, 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 wait. Hold on. You're talking about the ADL. No, this is the SPLC. What? No, murder and extremism in the United States in 2017. ADL Center on Extremism report. Well, we, so I, we have two different ones here because I have the uh, the the alt right is killing people by the SPLC. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Continue. Well, e <laughs> either way, I'm sure it's it's a similar list because I mean these these people like it's the same people doing these things. Um, so they have a list of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, thirteen su supposed alt right murderers, and they say. That they have identified 43 people murdered by the alt-right, 67 injured for a total of 110 victims of alt-right violence. They say 17 of these killed were in 2017. 43 injured were in uh, 40 or 43 injured were in 2017. So and, and there's so their their uh, stat here is supposed to they're trying to indicate that 40 40 percent of all alt-right murders in 2017, 65 percent of alt-right. Uh, Injuries were in 17, and then 55% of all like alt-right violence was in uh, 2017. But you actually look at this list, and you break down this list, and here's the list of people who they have identified as alt-right. Elliot Roger, Dylan Roof, <laughs> Christopher Sean Harper Mercer, Alexander Bissonnet, James Harrison Jackson, Sean Urbanski, Jeremy Joseph Christian, Lane Maurice Davis, James Alex Fields, William Matchison, Nicholas Giampa, Matthew Real, and Samuel Woodward. Okay, and so... It's a list of people. They all have at least killed one person. And but you but you start breaking it down, and you realize uh, SPLC not exactly playing uh, playing honestly with the facts here. So I guess the first one we can look at is of course Elliot Roger, and they they try to say that he was a white nationalist. They're saying that Elliot Roger was a white nationalist and an alt right um, alt right murderer. It's like well, if you actually listen to Elliot Roger and you you read what Elliot Roger was about. Um, and I mean, honestly, like, let's just look at L.A. Roger. He was mixed race. This was part of part of his identity crisis was the fact that he was mixed race. Um, not exactly typical that you would see a mixed race person going on a white nationalist killing spree. OK, so <laughs> yeah. this guy was not like like a white identitarian or, or alt right guy. He was definitely an incel. Right. We have to we have to answer the incel question. He's definitely involuntary celibate. But uh, not alt right, and so boom, there go seven of their murders right off the top. Um, with Dylan Roof, I mean, like Dylan Roof, you you could you could say like was like uh, Roof. I I don't know. I I haven't read his manifesto, but um, you know, either like white nationalist or white supremacist. Like we should be completely honest. Um, he was he was he did have like political motivations for what he did. Um, he wanted to start like a a race war, but. Um, yeah. Uh, well, okay. Uh, first of all, just uh, regarding Elliot Roger, I mean, uh, you know, it's kind of unfair to say he's not a white supremacist. I mean, I am pretty sure he's whiter than you. Like, you're both Hapas, no, right? <laughs> no, Dylan Roof is ac or, uh, Roger was actually a Hapa. Elliot Roger, yeah. like, like literally a Hapa. Okay. I'm, okay. Uh, I am lit lit twelve percent. Lit twelve percent meme. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <lit> <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like uh, Dylan Roof, you know, the, the thing is, okay, so that happened in uh, 2015. Uh, that was really before anyone, uh, or before the alt right was like really memed into the public consciousness, right? So, like, to paint him as alt right is unfair for that reason. Uh, but mm -hmm. you know, like, it, it, in addition to that, I mean, he's like very much like uh, this like weird like race war. Obviously, uh, like a race war, read siege type. Yeah, like and like and Adam Waffen, bef Adam Waffen before Adam Waffen existed. Yeah, and, and so that's uh, that's not alt right. <laughs> like that's not what you know the, the alt right's about. So I don't even understand uh, that. But of course, like anything, uh, anyone who apparently, according just off the two first people on this, on this list, anyone who has any views about uh, women or uh, 
on race that don't conform with the mainstream apparently now is all right, according to the SPLC. Right. Yeah. No, that's that's the thing, dude, is is and like we talked about with the, the Florida shooter, like they're going after, after this guy who was like Jewish, like he was ethnically Jewish, um, clearly like also like part Castizo or something. And they're trying to say this guy was like a white supremacist. It's like, are you are you kidding, bro? Like, like, are you really trying to trying to do that? Um, just because uh, apparently he like didn't like black people or something, that doesn't mean that he's like like a white nationalist and it doesn't ascribe any political motivation to it. Right. Yeah. Like this, the, like the Florida shooter, for example. Um, but obviously, like with Roof, like he was just insane. Right. Like anyone, anyone who is going to go kill innocent people is insane. OK, let's let's make that very, very clear. It's insane and unacceptable and, and not like in any way justifiable. And if his action, if it, if his intent was to like start like some kind of like race war or something. Yeah, that's obviously like beyond unacceptable. So like, you know, Jared Holt, I know you're listening. Like, don't. Like you're you're a dishonest slime bag if you try to use any of this to like like say like oh this is like defensive roof or anything it, it clearly is not but this Dylan Roof is I think the only one on this list where you can say this was actually like politically motivated like like a politically motivated like white supremacist attack okay yeah because um, then you look at like Chris Mercer this Chris Mercer guy who shot up like Umpqua Community College he was mixed race and he was not like a white nationalist he was not like he was not politically motivated again. Obviously, shoot this. This this was a crazy, evil guy, um, and by his own description, uh, Chris Mercer, the, Chris Harper Mercer, the shooter in Umpqua Community College, was a mixed race guy. So the SPLC to try to say, oh, he's a white supremacist, white nationalist, like, okay, that just like doesn't fly like on its face. And then uh, this Sean Urbanski guy, for example, um, has like not even been convicted. Like the defense is disputing the supposed evidence in the case. Um, Jeremy Christian, who killed two people was killed after he was assaulted or he killed people after he was assaulted right jeremy christian was like harassing like some muslim girl on a train for like wearing a hijab which is like like okay like that's kind of like socially unacceptable but like like it's not violence it's just like a guy being a dick so he's he's harassing these girls for for wearing the hijab and then some like bug man like gets up on him like a, assaults him apparently is the story and then christian responds by knifing the guy knifing the guy who assaulted him it's like Okay, I mean, you know, you're going to go assault people on public transit and and you don't expect to get, like, a violent response? Like, dude, like, and again, not to defend murder, but uh, J Jeremy Christian apparently responded um, to being assaulted. It's like, don't don't assault people if you don't want to, like, cause violence. Uh, Lane Davis was somebody who was, like, criminally, like, like actually insane. I, Lane Davis lived in Seattle. He, like, killed his father. And, like, it, it wasn't even about politics. Like, Lane Davis was, like, an insane, like, Pizzagate conspiracy guy. Who yeah, lost well, his he mind wasn't, about wasn't he like an alt light Cernovich type? Yeah, yeah, he was like a total like alt light guy. Like I, I think, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. He would like go to events in Seattle and stuff. I've probably, I've probably like seen him before, but like I, I don't remember him at all. Um, mm. But he was like, he was like actually insane, like on antidepressants, on a bunch of drugs. Uh, James Fields, who killed uh, Saint Heather in Charlottesville. Like was being chased by an Antifa professor with a with an AR-15 by yep. their own admission. Um, he didn't even hit Heather. Like the car in front of him hit Heather. Heather died of a heart attack. So, like yeah. to say he's and, he's and a murderer. His car was was hit by baseball bats before he sped up. Like imagine that. First you see some guy chasing you around with the AR-15, and then you know I mean if you don't have a lot of experience with guns or something. I can definitely uh, imagine that a metal bat hitting the back of your car might sound like a shot, like a yeah. gunshot, right? Like sure. it's completely possible this guy freaked out, hit the gas, and that's what it looked like, right? He mm -hmm. didn't actually run into a crowd like you said. Uh, yeah. uh, like you said, he actually hit the car in front of him, which hit other people because they were surrounded by people, right? So, uh, you know, like that's just – it's absolutely ridiculous how – we're supposed to believe that James Fields is like some alt right terrorist, right? Uh, yeah, it's like it, he's a kid who who panicked and like yeah, yeah. And by the way, that would not have happened if Charlottesville police had done their jobs. And I know this has been revised on every every podcast already, but if Charlottesville police had done their jobs, like this whole Fields thing would not have happened. Um, and the most disgusting reaction to the Fields thing, in my opinion, was people like Ben Shapiro who were saying this was like premeditated alt right terrorism. And like the alt right is the same as ISIS because like they're running people over with cars now. It's like, dude, okay, 
there's a I know you're you're a slimy like like sleaze ball, Ben Shapiro, but but there's a clear difference between like renting a truck and like running over people at a Christmas market and getting chased by a, an Antifa professor with a with a AR fifteen and like accidentally hitting a crowd of people. Like yeah. if you can't see the, the, the nuance there, like you're either dishonest or like criminally stupid. So the main point, the reason we're going into this, the reason we're dissecting this list is because when you when you start looking through it, you realize that like less than half of these supposed murders, these alt right murders, are actually like alt right involved. In fact, the only ones that that you could even say, you could even make an argument are related to the alt right is Dylan Roof. And even that is like before the alt right was a thing. It was in in 2015 before like any of these these ideas were like being talked about. So to, so to try to make the connection between like modern you know uh, nationalist thinking or modern like nationalist politics and Dylan Roof is is clearly like insane to try to make that leap. Yeah. And the reason this is important is because you'll see like normie conservatives like Ben Shapiro types, um, like. Cuck, cuck conservatives and leftists like share articles like this and be like see this is proof the alt rights like dangerous terrorists but when you dig into the numbers and you dig into the actual like incidents you will quickly learn and, and, and it will be quickly apparent that like no dude this is all bs like this is all a fake constructed narrative yeah uh unfortunately uh you know unfortunately i dissected the adl list but looking through this uh yeah, <laughs> I prepped on the wrong thing. Sorry, dude. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, looking through this, uh, it, it's much the same as the uh, uh, ADL list, right? Where like, for example, there's this guy that uh, killed the parents of his ex-girlfriend because uh, the parents made uh, made her break up with him, right? Uh, Nick Giampa. Uh, he was also... Yeah, and it's like, okay, well, maybe you're just pissed yeah, he, off because yep. the parents, uh, like, obviously that's not acceptable and this guy should, like, uh, hang, right? I, I don't care, like, life in prison or, or hanging, death by hanging is good yeah. Good options for me. But, like, uh, it, it doesn't mean the killing was political, right? Like, the, the guy had political views, right? right. It doesn't mean right. he killed the parents over politics, right, uh, over his political views. Um, so yeah, there's many examples like this. And if that's the standard we're going to go by, then let's look at the violence from the left. Let's look at the violence from Black Lives Matter, right? We know that was it like, I believe yeah. this year it was 51% of murders were uh, committed by black people. Uh, I think last year it was, or, or well, not last year, but you know, the, the year before that, cause like the statistics take time to come out. Uh, but last year or the, the year before, or in, in 2016, let's say, uh, it was like 53% of murders were committed by black people. Now, how many of those murderers do you think are supporters of Black Lives Matter? Right? Mm -hmm. Now, so mm -hmm. if we're going to say that anyone who hold, like if I go out and murder someone right now because he stole my car or something, right? Uh, or... Uh, he's my let's say I, I pull like a Rand Paul neighbor thing like my my neighbor decided to like trim something on my side of the lawn and I get pissed off and like tackle him and accidentally murder him uh, now if that's a political political violence now if that's what the left as if that's what the SPLC if that's what the ADL describes as political violence then we have to take uh, every single murder done by a Black Lives Matter supporter and we know most black people can uh, are most most black people are Black Lives Matter supporters, right? Or at least implicitly, mm -hmm. right? And uh, you know most murders are committed by black criminals. So, <laughs> if anything, I, I think it's safe to say that at least twenty five percent of murders in this country are committed by Black Lives Matter supporters, right? By leftists, <laughs> if not more, if not the full fifty one percent, or you know, uh, however many murders blacks committed in the, in the past yeah. year. So uh, it, it's a completely ridiculous standard that if we were to apply equally, we'd see how the left uh, is much more violent than the right. And then but also the thing would be is like every side would, would be criminal because there's people of all different political persuasions that commit crimes for apolitical reasons, 
right? Mm-hmm. Um, and but we already saw there was like explicit uh, uh, Black Lives Matter violence when that uh, sniper gunned down was it five cops at a Black Lives Matter rally in in Houston, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's just uh, the the standard they're applying here is ridiculous. Uh, and uh, but you know. We can't expect anything better from organizations like the SBLC or the ADL <laughs> or the mainstream media that's in their pocket. Yeah, yeah, that that takes the word of these radical left wing activist groups as absolute fact and just reprints it without feeling the need to verify or fact check it. And uh, yeah, because they, they they give themselves these official sounding names like the Southern Poverty Law Center, anti defamation. Like it's like, oh, are you pro defamation? <laughs> like yeah. the anti defamation, like it begs the question. It's like, oh, are you pro defamation? Um, but uh, they give themselves these, these names, and the media just runs with them and accepts whatever they say as fact. And we know that they have an agenda. They have a very decided and uh, explicit political agenda. If you if you are to look into it, so. Um, yeah, it's 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 one of those things that you need to be willing to combat. I mean, the 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 narrative you need to be. God, I don't say. What, look, I, I know that Jared Holt is out there like mining this show for sound bites over at Right Wing Watch, um, <laughs> but uh, you need to be willing to combat this narrative when it comes up and when people like Ben Shapiro or other a conservatives bring it up and say, "Oh, the alt right, they they go out and murder people." Be like, "No, dude, like that's fucking bullshit." And here's why. And here here is the itemized list of reasons why that is bullshit. Because if they can if they can paint everyone who is a nationalist or on the right wing on the further right as a violent like like possible murderer like that will will do a lot to stigmatize people from ever listening to the ideas and listening to the good the good ideas that are, that we have over here and and we advocate for so very important to push back on the lies and the fake news on the on the wrong narrative and uh, that's what we try to do here so let's uh, let's wrap it up we ran out ran on a little bit long there with our talk about libertarianism but uh, <laughs> Alex where can people find you uh, what where can people find your writing and all the work that you do. Uh, you can just uh, follow me on Twitter if if you're not banned for from now. Twitter yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, at Alex Wodoslowski. Um And I'll be uh, contributing a little bit more to uh, AmpfirstMedia.com here in, in the coming weeks as well. Based. And uh, yeah, actually, uh, you know, because uh, I am helping you with editing and whatnot. Uh, yeah, you know, if people want to contribute, hit me up, and uh, we'll see if if you're a good fit. And go from there, so we can get more content out uh, on the website. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, and thanks for filling in on a on a just a short notice here. I do appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, no uh, problem. We'll, we'll definitely do it again soon. Um, yeah, and uh, people can find Alex. Uh, he'll be writing at amfirstmedia.com. Find him on Twitter and all that. And uh, back on Facebook in how many days? When are, when will we be back on Facebook? Uh, I think I have like another like two and a half weeks to go. Uh, so yikes. Yeah. What about you? Uh, 12 days, I think <laughs> I, I, I posted, I posted the tranny thing, like right after the state of the union, uh, when I was like, uh, president Trump is talking about jobs, uh, you know, putting America first and making America strong again. Uh, Joe Kennedy's talking about like trannies and speaking Spanish, like who's going to win 2018 and, uh, Facebook overlords did not take too kindly to that post. So I was, uh, unceremoniously kicked off. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, thanks again, man, for coming on. We do appreciate it. You can find America First at AmpfirstMedia.com and on Twitter at AmpfirstMedia. That's totally not my Twitter account. And you can find us over at uh, Libsyn, which is where this is going to be posted, and Patreon.com slash AmericaFirstMedia uh, for all of the uh, financial supporting needs. You can join the Discord over there, too, and get special perks on the Discord. We do appreciate that. We'll see you guys all next week with another episode of Nationalist Review. Till then, we'll see you all later. Thanks for listening.